You're listening to the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. Yeah, it's a mouthful. For more great shows like the one you're about to enjoy, visit electronicmediacollective.com. And now, our feature presentation. Hello, welcome to the Middle Age Movie Views Podcast. Three guys asking... Whose podcast is this anyway? We asked you here because we were sorry for you and account of you watching bad movies all the time. What you get for feeling sorry for people? Well, I ain't sorry no more, you crazy B-movie watching weirdo. And as always, my name is Tim and my podcasting partners are... Mechanic Matt. And sitting in for Joey while he receives a free exam from the Border Patrol as he returns from his trip around the world, it's our friend from Dungeon Master Elite YouTube channel, it's Rick. Say hello, Rick. What's going on, everyone? All right, Rick, what are we watching at the Nickelodeon tonight? All right, tonight we're going to be reviewing the 1951 adaptation of The African Queen, directed by John Huston, starring... Humphrey Bogart, and Katherine Hepburn. All right, guys. Our usual question is, when did you first see this film? And I'm going to ask you first, Rick, when was the first time you seen The African Queen? The yeah, first time I saw this movie was today. <laughs> <laughs> I, have been, I have been recommended to watch this thing. Um, actually, it was a little while ago. It was a couple years ago. But you guys know how movie lists go. People are like, hey, you got to watch this movie. It's going to be super cool. And you put it on your list, and you'll get around to it eventually at some point is usually what happens. And that's kind of like what happened here. I, I really did want to watch it for quite some time. And I just, you know, I, I'm not I'm, a t I'm not the type of person to really go out of my way to watch movies that were made before I was. So... <laughs> <laughs> so that was the barrier you know what i'm saying so am i you know am i glad that this was the opportunity to be able to check up on this movie yes so it was just today nice how about you tim when was the first time you saw the african queen i had thought i had seen this movie before uh because i remember distinctly the part of the movie where he comes out of the water and he has a bunch of new friends with him uh <laughs> But I, I remember watching that and then thinking, nope, not for me, and moved on. When I was much younger, I believe back in the day of like, you know, Fraser Thomas's family classic. So I was probably in my teens somewhere. Uh, and, and I remembered nothing else from this movie. So I think it was just a fleeting, you know, a remote pass by, you know, seeing it. Nope, move on. And uh, that was it. So this was actually my first viewing of the film as well. Wow. Well, guess what? We have three fresh new viewers on this because this is the first time I've actually watched this movie. I've seen like clips like here and there, like when they did the Catherine Hepburn tribute to her when she passed away at the at one of the Oscars. And that, she didn't pass away at one of the Oscars, but, you know, a tribute at one of the Oscars for when she had passed. And honestly, I had never seen this movie before in my entire life. So I'm like, I am I'm looking forward to watching this film. And I got to say, it did not disappoint. So. And maybe she should have passed away at the Oscars. That's how you get an award for sure. <laughs> hey, Her final performance was right at the Oscars. And Going out in the bang. Damn it if she doesn't get one. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> well, that death was fantastic. She gets an Oscar for her dying on the Oscars. You love me. You truly. <laughs> Everybody's just standing there going, do, do we applaud? When, when, when's, when's it over? Uh. Fat pause there. <laughs> All right, so the African Queen. What do you say we dive into the story? All right, so during the start of World uh, War... Uh, hang on, man. I, th I think you're going to do it. We got to, okay. as always, uh, you know, find something fun for you to do. And I mean, this one's pretty self-evident. I, I think you, think you got to do it as Bogart. I don't think there's any other way to do this one. <laughs> so uh, I think you should read the synopsis as uh, the Bogart of your choice. All right, let's see if I can do this. Well, well, during the start of World War I, a missionary is left by herself in the German-controlled East Africa. The woman known as Rose Sayre is picked up by a local riverboat captain, Charlie Allnut, and the two of them try to make their escape from possible German army patrols. 
Rose convinces Charlie to attack a German boat that is patrolling the only lake that is a foothold to the English army. After a long riverboat cruise, the two must make their only way to attack the German boat. Will their plan succeed? Or will they become crocodile dinner? Now pass me that gin bottle. Very nice. <laughs> I don't think I could have done any better. So very, <laughs> very well done. I was trying to talk out of the side of my mouth. Very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The only line I know other than that is uh, the sweetheart line that he does, and I can't even do that one right now. <laughs> well, play it again, Sam. Oh, yeah. There's that. Now that I haven't completely butchered Bogart, let's go ahead and uh, let's talk a little bit about this movie. So it's set at the beginning of World War One. The, the version that I watched was actually on a streaming service, uh, and I noticed that the title cards was just like horizon pictures. And then it kind of gave me just a general rundown of the, of the actors and, and you know, the normal title sequence that we see from the 1950s and stuff. And I noticed that they didn't use a title card for the African queen. And I was just curious, did you guys watch the same version that I did? Or is there another version out there? I probably, I watched it on a streaming service too. I think I watched it on uh, MGM plus cause it's an MGM film. So Okay. Uh, and I was, uh, actually I, I started, I should back that up. I started on Amazon and I noticed it was in four by three and I'm like, well, that's wrong. So I'm going to go over to MGM cause it was their movie. And then I brought up and it was four by three over there too, which I thought was really odd. And, um, you know, cause I know this movie has been restored in like 2017, 2019. And yeah. my only thought is, is maybe they don't have any of the widescreen, uh, versions anymore that they could get their hands on to clean up or they weren't in good shape. So they had to use a, a TV cut down four by three for this. So I, I not hundred percent sure, but I just, that struck me as odd. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, you know, I didn't even pay attention. I watched it on two services as well. Like not at the same, not the same time <laughs> and not twice, but half of it on one service and half of it on another service, because honestly there was a part in the film where, they showed a lot of uh, German speech, German, like German speaking in German. And uh -huh. I was trying to get the subtitles. Man, I tried really hard, man. I even had my phone up to the to the screen trying to uh, grab the Google Translate. And I got a couple words, but I wasn't able to get all the stuff. And it was really frustrating because I like to know what people are saying. But but yeah, I, I, I checked it out like on two different services. And... Um, the the videos were pretty much the same. Um, there was a little bit of a difference. In one, it started out with uh, with a strange screen in the very beginning. With uh, man, I don't remember what was on it. It was all written in white. It didn't even have um, it didn't even have like the MGM uh, opening or whatever. It was I don't know I don't know what it came from, but yeah. Yeah, you know I had I had a similar issue because I didn't. I didn't see any subtitles whenever the Germans were speaking. So I kind of got the gist of what they were saying because I kind of can understand a little bit of it in in the frame of context. Like when the guy said that he only speaks German and not English. Um, but yeah, that's that. it's interesting where it's at. I mean, I, I ended up watching on one service with both my eyes. So, I mean. Um. <laughs> Is there a version out there that has subtitles or was this just one that never was subtitled at all? Would be I my don't guess. I don't know. No, I, I, the one of them that I tried had the basics of the subtitle. Like it had subtitles in English, but then in when they were speaking in German, it just said they were speaking in German. Oh, so I was nice. like, dang. All right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you pretty much got the point. Like, you know, let's go in and do this bad thing here and then, you know, shoot the boat. That's pretty much all you need to get out of all the German that's in this film, I think. Yeah. Well, in the there in that one particular, uh, we'll get to it when we get to it. There's something yeah. that they said yeah. when I used the Google Translate, and it was like, and if I, I think if you spoke German, I think you could get a little bit more out of it because it wasn't so straightforward. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Well, so the movie opens up, and it were set in East Africa, in German occupied East Africa, at the beginning of World War One, and of course we don't know that it's World War One. Well. We kind of get the idea about World War One once once we get into the characters, um, but we're first introduced to the to the characters right off the bat, and that is uh, Reverend Samuel Sayer and his sister Rose Sayer, and we're introduced them because they're the, the Reverend is having a sermon, and of course every, they're singing a hymn, and it's I, I couldn't help but laugh because you know it they're singing a 
a, a hymn in English and these poor tribe members are trying to sing along and they're, they're just, they're, they're, they're not, they're not enunciating. They're not singing. I wouldn't say correctly, but you know, you just hear a lot of howling and, and I'm just, part of me was kind of laughing about it and I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'm probably going to go to hell for that bit. But uh, honestly, I thought it was, it was kind of interesting that, uh, you know, we, we established that these are missionaries in, uh, in tribal Africa. And then of course, after we see them, we then see the, uh, the, the African queen pull up with our, our main character, Charlie Allnut in it, AKA, uh, Humphrey Bogart. And we hear like his little steam whistle as he comes up the, uh, the riverbank. And so, uh, just out of those three characters, I, I thought it was neat that, uh, you know, we, we kind of get an establishment of, of what's going on in an, a, uh, English missionary for a Methodist church. Um, what were your guys' first uh, impressions of, of the, the three characters? And I'll go ahead and turn it over to, to Dungeon Master first. Um, it's pretty cool. For, uh, before, I do want to talk about that, but I do want to also say that I thought it was really cool when the first scene was cut. You got a good deal of, like, nature sounds. You know, I don't know if you guys noticed that, too, but I, I was like, ooh, like, that's kind of cool. I, I, I it. Maybe it's maybe I'm wrong, but it seemed real, right? Am I wrong about that? It sounded it, like they had an open air mic in Africa and they were recording everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you're there, why why wouldn't you? And that's why they went to the Congo specifically to film this because it had so much more wildlife. So yeah, I, I can see them just doing open air mic for a while and just you know getting the ambiance of the of the jungle. Um, but to get to the question, uh, the three characters. Man, it was pretty cool because this movie doesn't less rest its laurels on special effects or modern, you know, light and magic and stuff like that. So it really was rested on the acting of the, you know, the stars in, the, in this film. So with regard to Charlie, um, kind of a cool smooth kind of happy maybe a little bit happy-go-lucky fun loving maybe kind of guy i mean what he does with the cigar it, like he was messing with them you know what i'm saying like he knew he knew that they were in church right but he's right. like yeah you know what i'm gonna throw this cigar down and i know what they're gonna do they're gonna all fight for it and it's gonna cause this huge ruckus and the whole time he's laughing about it he's like yeah, look at these, you know, because they were, he's he's kind of poor-ish, working class, and Rose and Sam, they're, you know, middle class missionaries, you know, it's, uh, they're taking up, they're taking up the call of someone of, you know, financial wealth, you know, like, you don't see poor people taking up the call to be a missionary very often, you know what I'm saying, this is something that, that more wealthy people have the luxury to be able to do. And it just kind of seemed pretty funny when Charlie is messing with them and he knows what he's doing. And, but it wasn't like malicious. He was just like having a laugh, you know, at, at the expense of the church. And with regard to the howling, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. I, I think that they I, maybe, I mean, they don't speak uh, English. So, ah. Uh, I don't know, maybe, I mean, different culture, different way to go about things. I don't know. I I think I did hear some howls. So, yeah, I kind of, <laughs> I think I kind of agree with you, Matt. So, yeah. How about you, Tim? What was your first impressions of, of our three characters? Uh, I, I thought it was interesting because, you know, it starts off on uh, with the church. And as you said, you know, it's a, a lot of really poor singing going on there. And those are actually, you know, African tribesmen that they have that they're using as extras, which I guess they had a hard time doing because uh, there was a rumor going around amongst the tribes people that the film crew was cannibals. And if you showed up to do this stuff, they would eat you. So a lot of times they <laughs> had a hard time getting anybody to like help, you know, be a crew or show up and do scenes like this. So I thought that was kind of funny. And, and I think, you know, so they, I, I'm sure every one of them knew what they were really doing. They probably just like kind of come in and say some stuff, you know, the ones that kind of spoke English a little bit. And I, I think it's completely defined when you see that there's two kids sharing a hymnal, you know, and they're kind mm -hmm. of both holding it together and they're looking at it and they kind of look at each other. And, you know, they got that look like, I, I, what, what do we, I don't even know what we're supposed to be doing here. <laughs> like, just, you know, it's just like, <laughs> right. this is just complete chaos. So I thought that kind of summed up, 
as far as the tribesmen went. So I thought that was, you know, it, it gave it a very real feel, you know, and I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, when you get Humphrey Bogart shows up and he, you know, kind of strolls up, gives the one tribesman a cigar to watch his boat or whatever, you know, and that's a big deal for him. You know, it made him kind of the big man. And then he goes in, he's watching him, he grabs another cigar and, and like Rick point, I, he whips it out there and he knows what kind of commotion this is going to cause, but he's just kind of, you know, he's being a little rambunctious because he can be. And uh, I think he probably kind of likes giving, you know, the Reverend uh, Samuel and Rose a little bit of hard time. Uh, the, the, the Reverend character, uh, he wasn't in that long, so you don't really get a good feel for him or anything, but, uh, you know, typically what you would kind of sus- expect for a missionary, um, uh, and, and I'm watching them and I noticed, you know, it, you know, of course it's Africa is very hot. You know, you see Humphrey Bogart, he looks like he's, you know, pretty good. doesn't look overly hot and the Reverend don't look too bad, but when you look at Catherine Hepburn, she's like just sweating buckets, right? The whole time. Right. And, yeah. uh. Uh, you know, as I was like, wow, they, she's really bringing the performance. Well, she was actually bringing dysentery. Uh, <laughs> during that scene, she was, I guess, extremely sick. And they had a bucket right next to the piano. So every time they would call a cut, she would just turn over and start puking. <laughs> so she was <laughs> definitely ill during that whole oh scene. My so God. That's, that's really her sweating it out, trying to troop through this scene, you know, and stuff. And I guess that was pretty big with the whole crew. Like they just fighting off dysentery, you know, because the water was no good water and stuff. And, uh, you know, the same thing with the mosquitoes and all kinds of stuff, you know, uh, animals attacking them, deadly snakes. So they had a lot of fun trying to film this. And uh, I guess uh, Bogart, for the most part, tried to avoid getting sick like that. Uh, because him and the director just decided they were just going to drink, you know, booze the whole way through. So uh, that's kind of how they tried not to get dysentery. They, they just dr- drank nonstop, which was also something that Catherine Kath- Kath- Hepburn did not approve of. Uh, and I, 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 I got a good point where I can prove that fact later on because it's kind of out of place in the film. But uh, so, yeah, I thought she was a real trooper once you find that out. Like she's, you know, here she is just puking in a bucket after every scene. But she, you know, she made it all the way through. And I, I thought that that added, a, you know, a whole nother nice, you know, level to like how hot it is in Africa. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of realism going on there, I think. But uh, yeah, it was it was it was a good introduction to the characters. Like I said, the the, the Reverend, you know, it, he's just there to be a placeholder. But outside of that, the two main characters kind of get a feel for both of them. Yeah. How about yeah, you, it Matt? is. It is interesting, you know, we get we definitely get the the impression that, you know, Charlie is this, you know, happy go lucky, carefree kind of, you know, riverboat captain. He's just there to make some money, he's there to have a good time, you know. We get a little more of his background as the as the story progresses. We learn that, you know, he's Canadian and that he, you know, he came over to to build a bridge and, you know, he's he's basically like a a, a jack of all trades kind of guy. And then of course Catherine Hepburn our our titular character of Rose Sayer, she's, you know, you're straight laced. Um, I would almost put her in the same category, those, those classic Westerns where she was like the school mom that marm that would always, you know, follow the rules and, you know, always thumping the, 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 the do gooding Bible kind of character. Um, as, as we learn about Reverend Samuel though, is we kind of see him, he's, he's more concerned about I think he's more concerned about status. He's kind of got that classic English, you know, uh, stiff upper lip, keep the, you know, keep marching on kind of thing. And I mean, when they go to have tea with Charlie, you know, he's not really paying Charlie too much attention. He's looking at his, the mail that he received and he's got that, that, uh, newsletter from his, from his church or the, you know, his diocesan. And it, it shows everything that's going on. And he made his comment about someone younger than him becoming a bishop. So I just, I felt as though his character, although for what little part he had in there, you definitely got the, the impression that he really didn't, you know, care about Charlie. He's kind of like in his own little world kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I got about for those three characters. Yeah. So. That scene with the T was really cool, man. I, I, I looked at the, uh, the accolades and, um, Humphrey Bogart got the uh, the best actor award. He, not 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 only was he nominated, but he won. And um, it it sh- a lot of scenes it shows. This is one that it did. I mean that before anyone talked or said anything when they're sitting down for the tea, like he's already, he's over there like like if he could move around, like he was trying to physically move around because he didn't want to sit still like he wanted to get up or do something or he didn't know what we were supposed to do and you could like you could really feel 
the anxiety or the unpleasantness or the uncomfortability that he was feeling in that scene because he's like like licking his lips kind of thing. He's moving around. He's looking from side to side. He's twiddling his thumbs. He's like doing everything he could because he's like, I, I don't know if this, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. I don't know what's going on. And they're just like doing their thing. You know, the uh, uh, Rose and Sam, they're just sitting there doing their thing. Like this is a normal procedure. We're having tea and uh, Rose is putting together the tea and Sam is reading that thing. And, and, it was almost like a flex that Sam was doing because he was what, like you said, he was talking about these people that were inside this magazine, but these people inside the magazine were people of note. So right. he was not only was he talking about what's going on inside this magazine, but he was like, yeah, we know this person inside the magazine. Like these people that are important enough to be in this magazine, we're connected to them, which vicariously makes us important too because we know them personally you know and i think that put i think that put charlie even more like in a uncomfortable situation like maybe he kind of don't feel like he's supposed to be there kind of thing and then the whole thing with the with the uh stomach growling that was kind of funny it was a little bit of comic relief to the whole air, whole thing and um i didn't I didn't realize this until after when I was looking stuff up. Apparently, Charlie was supposed to be British in the in the uh, original uh, novella. He was British, and he was only Canadian to accommodate for Humphrey Bogart's lack of a British accent. Yeah, it would be a little hard to explain a British guy without an English accent. I'd be like having a <laughs> Frenchman with an e with an English accent. If he's a Frenchman, why does he have an English accent? Okay, so yeah, he's a Frenchman. So why not make him Canadian? Because then he's part of the Commonwealth, and then you know he can now tie tie his his uh, you know he can sit at the table of English. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, you mentioned uh, his his stomach growling. I kind of thought of that as is his his kind of way of trying to su suggest that you know he was hungry and that maybe he was fishing to get invited for dinner. Um, but then he kind of turns that that offer down as as the tea is over, and he, he kinda, he's kind of walking away from. Uh, Rose and Sam, and of course, then that leads into our uh, our big uh, the the big thing that's, that that causes the 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 movie to, to have its adventure, and that is World War One. You know, he talks to Sam. He says, "Oh, hey, you know, I I can be able to bring the mail because the Germans are preventing will be holding it up. You know, I'm probably not going to come back here very quickly because of the war going on." And of course, that makes Sam like kind of. Think, oh, well, what's going on? What do you mean by this war? Who's war? Who's going on about it? And, you know, Humphrey Bogart just kind of like says it kind of like nonchalantly. Like, oh, well, you know, it's the Germans that are fighting against the British. And, you know, and so you can see a little bit of worry on on uh, the reverend's face and you can see a lot of worry on Rose's face. And then, of course, Humphrey Bogart's like, pretty much like, OK, well, I'm going to take off. I'll see you guys later. Good luck with this whole <laughs> thing being in, you know, in East Africa, German controlled. And of course, you know, as soon as he leaves, I just thought it was interesting that, you know, we don't get like a long beat of, you know, regular life going on. Almost immediately, German soldiers show up as uh, as Sam and Rose are, are praying. And I just thought that was kind of kind of strange. I thought that they would at least, you know, space it out, try to give you this idea that, that you know, there's like some kind of tension building before we see anything. And uh, wouldn't you know it, you know, the German soldiers show up and uh, they immediately uh, go ape on the entire um, village. I mean, they start rounding people up, you know, and uh, they start setting fires to the village. And at first I'm like, well, what are they doing? And then it, it dawned on me that they were they were trying to gather up people to join their army to fight the British. Um, what were your guys' thoughts on on this whole thing about, you know, the Germans coming in? and uh, basically destroying the village. Um, and I'll throw it over to Tim first. What was your thoughts on this whole scene? Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. I, I think starting with the tea, you know, I, I thought it was pretty entertaining with the stomach grumble. And I don't think that was really his way of trying to get an invitation. I think that was his body's way of just saying, you know, dude, 
uh, I'm really hungry and all you do is feed me gin. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I think it kind of alludes to him, you know, be, the movie throughout, like he's kind of a big drinker and probably less of an eater. So, and I think he's kind of hungry, but he's trying to be proper, you know, and, and have a proper tea with them, you know, kind of play the social graces. And, you know, when she's like, would you like to stay for dinner? I think he's like, nah, I'm just gonna go back and get a drink. You know, I think that's kind of his <laughs> mindset a little bit. Uh, and uh, so he kind of leaves or whatever. And and I thought it was interesting when he, he mentions the war kind of nonchalantly because it shows like it's right at the beginning of World War One, and people who don't fathom yet what this war is about to become. You know, I mean, you know, the European nations have been fighting off and on for centuries, you know, with each other. So it's probably not super uncommon to have one go after the other, you know, because, ah, you know, it's the Germans say the English started it. The English say the Germans started it, you know, and he's like, who knows? And, but then he's like, and then, you know, there's some other countries that are involved like Italy and France. And he starts naming off and it's like, you know, and then that's when they really start to get alarmed. Cause you know, I think you're starting to put it together where he's really not thinking about it. It's like, that's a lot of countries to have fighting each other. You've named almost all the European countries, you know, he goes on and it's a couple of the, I think he just says Mediterranean or something like that. And he mentioned Spain, which is not right. Cause Spain didn't fight. And I thought that was kind of weird that they put that in there, but, uh, but yeah, so he kind of alludes to this, you know, massive world war that's happening without really realizing that it, it's a massive world war yet, you know? And, and it, it it shows too how you know communications is is hard to come by you know especially if you're way out in the sticks you know, this whole war has been going on they have no idea it's the first they've heard of it so uh, I, th I thought that was kind of kind of telling you know uh, with the way I think that that kind of news spread and and again people's just non reaction to what was going to be a monumental war for four years uh, and then then he leaves and I, I this is the part where the movie. Uh, I, it, it it makes me take a step back and I, I feel like I feel like there's a lot of aspects about this movie that is super rushed and this is where it starts um I think there's some good writing and the care the people who play the characters are awesome I mean you know the the you know the performances in this are outstanding especially when you consider there's not that many actors so I mean just you know B Bogart and Hepburn's you know performances are outstanding but they just did clumsy stuff like this where you know, they, he leaves and it's almost like immediately, like the Germans are like, okay, the guy with the boat's going, we go in now, you know, they're just, you yeah. know, they just come out of nowhere. And, uh, I think there's supposed to be a time lapse there, but they just, for whatever reason, didn't add a little something in there to kind of buffer it out or whatever. Cause you think he would notice a bunch of Germans coming out of, out of the jungle or something or, or the, the, you know, the village going in the flames almost instantly. So it's just weird, clumsy and, and forced. So, uh, I think this is where a I little almost, bit of the movie falls apart for me. I almost thought that it was kind of like, uh, something that came about from that age of movie making, like the, ha the, like unhappy coincidence, like this ironic, uh, uh, scene, you know what I'm saying? I guess I'm not too familiar with the, that age of movie, but something just kind of told me from watching, you know, reruns of uh, shows that were made in the 60s and the 50s and stuff that this might have been something like that. Like one of those unhappy coincidences, you know, like, oh, by the way, there's Germans coming and then here the Germans come. You know what I'm saying? Like, I might be wrong, but that's what I attributed it to. Like that was the style of of movie of storytelling back then. But I would uh, I would agree wrong. with that. I, I think Matt and I've seen that when we did like Touch of Evil. There was some of that in there, I think, and the same thing. Even North by Northwest had a few scenes that made you kind of pause for a second. Like that seemed like a really harsh transition there or whatever. So I. I I think they were big into writing the story, but they, you know, they were just always like story and pace. It was, uh, you know, just, you know, write a good story, keep the pace moving kind of thing. So what, what do you think, Matt? Yeah, I like I said, I, I thought it was rather interesting that the Germans show up immediately. I mean, it was like not even like a three second beat. I mean, they, they the Sam and Rose got down on their knees and started praying for the for the soldiers of, of England. You know, they were hoping that England would prevail and almost immediately they, they show up. So you would think that you know, Humph Humphrey Bogart would at least see have seen the, the flames and stuff as he's traveling down the river, getting away from that area. Um, yeah, it seemed very forced, very, very, very quick. Um, I, I think it would have probably helped the audience feel more tension to kind of see maybe like a few things happen before the, the German soldiers come in. Um, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, it almost feels like maybe I'm wrong again with this, but 
maybe it's kind of more like the natural progression and transition from from stories being told on places like Broadway theater to film and the slow progression and evolution of storytelling. Because if you were to go to a play, this is the type of stuff that you see. You know what I'm saying? Like okay. that unhappy coincidence to, to move the story along. You know what I mean? But I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, 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 I don't know. What do you think? I Tim? think you might be right. I mean, it does have a kind of a play feel to it. I think, didn't we say that about one of the other ones too? I think we kind of, yeah. attributed it to being more like a you know written like a play than a movie yeah i think when we were talking about north by northwest which is you know same time period kind of um you know you had that that 50s feel where you know they're they're delivering their lines almost like it's in a in a play um so yeah i would i would agree with 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 you guys on that um so then uh there's back to the back to the story um so yeah, so the, you know the Germans show up. They basically sack the town or sack the village. Take all the all the villagers with them to basically. Uh, there's a, a term where they inscript them into being soldiers conscript. and to help out conscript. Thank you. Yes, You're that's welcome. it. Um, English, not my first. Uh, good me fail. Bad bad. <laughs> me, me fail English. That's impossible. <laughs> um. So yeah, so they conscript the uh, the villagers to the soldiers in the in the war to fight for the Germans, and of course, when the Germans show up and Sam is trying to stop the German soldiers, we have this really neat cut where like you see the back of the German soldiers fa- uh, or the, the back of the German soldiers. He picks up his, his rifle and like hits uh, the Reverend in the face and like knocks him down, and then the next time we see the Reverend, he comes up and he's got like this huge bruise on the side of his face, <laughs> and I'm like, dang, that was like almost instantly. I mean, he just he just swelled up like a like you know, and I, I, mean, I realize it's makeup in that, but I'm like, I think they did a little did that a little bit. Yeah. Maybe they're in a time warp know, there. Man. Maybe everything's moving super fast. You know, like, you know, Bogart walks off, the Germans walk in, he hits him with the thing, he instantly brews up. And yeah, so maybe there's a little time warp in the Congo we don't know about. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know, man. Medicine back then ain't that good. So you got to be careful with wounds like that. It could kill you, you know? <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> that's that's because they, they just don't make guns like they used to back when they were made of really hard wood. <laughs> Oh, you mean like uh, maple or oak? Men, men <laughs> knew how to beat other men down back in the day. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, after the village is destroyed, we we cut we cut back, and I'm assuming this is maybe like a day or two later. And uh, this is kind of this 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 next scene was I thought was interesting because I, I was watching, I, I saw the wide cut, and obviously the two people that are in the picture frame are there on set or on location in Africa and the person quote working the field does not look anything like, um, like the Reverend. I mean his hair, yes, he's bald, but his hair is like gray on the temples and he looks a little skinnier. And then when we cut to the two shot, when Catherine Hepburn walks into the screen to talk to her brother, it's now at Ealing studio and everything is like this, um, where they do that rear projection and you can kind of see that they, they kind of stand out from the background. And then that's when you get to see the, the all the dialogue going on. So I thought it was kind of clever filmmaking. But if you if you watch it in high def or you watch it on the streaming service where you know your TVs are a little better, you kind of notice that it's not the same actors. Um, I was just curious if you guys caught that as well. I did not. Okay. I didn't either. The the ah. first part the first part of me watching I was on something totally different. So I, I, it wasn't high def. I will def, definitely it wasn't. So there was a lot of you, things that just kind of blended. So you weren't watching on a Fisher Price movie maker, were you? Um, I mean Mattel, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so speaking of dying and getting you know butted in the face, so we get the impression that. Reverend Sayer has just completely like flipped his rocker. He's like in complete shock. Um, and so his sister's like kind of taking care of him as she escorts him back into his, into his house. And you, you get the feeling that, you know, he's probably suffering from PTSD. Um, and then all of a sudden, again, like another quick cut where after he like 
falls down and he's he gets helped up back into bed and he says a few things and talks about his sister like his sister's not even the person he's talking to and then like the next thing we find out is that he just ends up dying um again it it, it felt very quick and forced in my in my opinion um what did you guys think about his whole death and 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 everything leading up to to getting him out of the picture so we can move forward with the storyline I think uh, I think it's kind of telling. I mean, uh, it, it's an interesting it, it's an interesting way to uh, get a little more background. I think on Rose and uh, and it kind of gives you a little background on him just before he kicks the bucket. So because uh, I thought it was really weird that he gets that sick that quick, you know. And I, I either either those Germans really know how to give a beat down, and that's the reason he's you know that sick, or he already had some malaria or something going on, and I, I don't know, maybe just the horror of this. Because I thought the other interesting aspect of of when the village is burning, when you look at his face, like he did a really good job of just looking uh, like on in horror, like this this was like the worst thing this man had ever seen. So it completely traumatized him. So you know. It probably, if he was already sick, it probably helped to his decline. Although, again, super fast and clumsily done. But I thought it was interesting when he's in the bed and he's talking. And he's really not talking to her anymore. He's just hallucinating. And and you get this thing where he was going to school for something. And he was like, if I pass this test, you know, I can go on to do an X, Y, and Z. But if I don't, then I'm going to go ahead and become a missionary. And then he kind of gives a backhand to his sister, Rose. He's like, you know, and I know Rose will follow because she's kind of a homely woman or whatever, but she's a good woman. So she'll just follow me. And you can see the look on her face oh, where yeah. she's kind of like, did he just insult me? But she's like, you know, but he's feverish. I'm going to let that go or whatever. But so you realize that this man, whatever he wanted to do in his life failed. And he's praying to, you know, basically he's kind of talking to God. He's having a conversation with like, you know, don't let me fail. And if I do, then let me at least have a, a station you know, in Europe or in Britain and make my, my mom proud or whatever. And that doesn't happen. He gets shipped off to Africa and she comes with him. And so it kind of gives you a little background of him before he finally kicks it and explains why now, you know, why she's there. So she's just like, well, I'll follow him. Cause she is kind of a spinster, you know, she's an old maid. So apparently nobody wanted to marry her. And, and, uh, you know, she's not a great looking woman. So she's like, I'm just going to go do this because I don't have a lot of option. It's kind of how my takeaway from the whole scene. Gotcha. How about you, Rick? Uh, that's, that's pretty good, Tim. I, I think that I can definitely get on board with that. No pun intended. But, um, I also noticed something not at this point, but later on. And I kind of went back to this point and was like, holy smokes, man, there's a message here throughout the film about hope and despair. And I think the message is that despair will kill you because in the very beginning, that's what happens. Like what Tim said, and and as a result, I mean, you don't see him get, you know, bitten by a mosquito. It definitely has been at least a week or two because the the bruise on his face is gone, you know? Yeah. So it definitely has been a little bit of time. But but it doesn't show him getting malaria necessarily. I mean, it probably does happen, but... I think it was intentional that it don't show him getting bit or anything like that or having mosquitoes around him and stuff <clears throat> because I think that I think that the story does want to depict that like if you despair, it will be your downfall that will kill you. And Rose sees it and later on she brings hope to the table uh, a, a couple times for Charlie. So um, so yeah, I I thought that that was kind of not at when not when I was watching it, but later on I came back and I was like, oh, that that kind of does make sense as a theme throughout this whole uh, story. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's an interesting take. Um, yeah, I I have to agree with with both you guys that yeah, I definitely definitely see that in this film. Um, and you know, just a a slight thing. So, you know, you're talking about Catherine Hepburn sweating. I really noticed in this scene that, man, she's wearing this long dress. She's got to be hot, like 24-7. And I'm surprised she didn't get, you know, malaria or, you know, dysentery. The character didn't get dysentery while, you know, having to suffer. Because I'm sure once they burned the village down, I'm sure like any fresh water they had had been destroyed. And maybe that might have been why um, Sam had passed away. Uh, and again, you know, you you did mention, and I, and 
I still noticed the same thing that his bruise was gone. So it, it must have been some time. Um, and even even after he dies and and Humphrey Bogart comes back or Charlie comes back into the picture, quite literally like walks up between these rows of burnt out buildings. And uh, we get the conversation with him and, and Rose about what happened. Um, I thought it was interesting that, you know, he's like, well, hey, look, you're the only sole survivor left. Um, do you have a spade? Let's go bury your brother and then grab some stuff and get the heck out of here because the Germans are going to come back. They're going to they're going to come after the African Queen because it's the only boat that's, you know, worth a damn going up and down the river. You know, come with me if you want to live kind of thing. You <laughs> so, know, in in that scene when he's talking to her, <clears throat> when he comes back, I have to completely hand it to Humphrey Bogart because I was not actively paying attention, but I mean, I was, but I wasn't necessarily trying to critique his acting, but he was doing a lot of nervous twitches. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. He was moving his fingers around and you could tell he was kind of moving his head around a little bit and stuff like that. Like he was uncomfortable with speaking to Rose and like you get this, you get this kind of feel that he kind of likes her to some degree. You know what I'm saying? And that yeah. maybe like, like he almost like he ain't shooting his shot. You know what I'm saying? Like it ain't about that, but you almost get to feel like it kind of is obviously up until the point when he finds out about her brother. But, um, but yeah, I thought that that was really cool that, that he, he did those little things, you know what I mean? To, yeah. uh, to really show a little bit more in his character. Yeah I, yeah, I definitely, I definitely got a feeling from that interaction that he he's friends with them, he's friendly with them, but he really doesn't know them all that well. And I, mm. I could see that some of that nervousness might have been, you know, maybe he's not quite ready to to expand the friendship more, but you know, he's willing to help out somebody that he knows, and that's kind of like what I got out of the whole thing. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting is, so I know Catherine Hepburn later on in life you know I've, I've seen movies where she's much older you know she looks like an old lady um but in this movie she looks much younger and humphrey bogart even though he was you know of that era he kind of looked a little older a little rougher and i was just trying to think okay how old are these actors and how old are these characters so i did a little a little background research and i'm like okay so katherine hepburn at the time of this filming was 44 years old wow um, Humphrey Bogart was 52. So Dang. yeah, I'm like, okay, well she looks a little younger, you know, I could probably see a, you know, a 50 year old, you know, kind of falling in love with, for, with a 44 year old, but we'll, we'll get more into that a little later. Um, what about their characters? What age were their characters supposed to be? You know, I never read the book and I didn't kind of, I didn't look, look that up. Okay. So, but well, I'm kind of, go ahead, Tim. I was going to say, I thought, you know, when he kind of comes up and finds her, you know, he kind of talks about how, you know, every place else he's gone has been destroyed. No, they got you too. But um, I, I think he just kind of takes her along because it's one of those, as you said, like, we're the last two, we should get out of here. But it, there's it, this was a little clumsy too because there was no talk of her going and she didn't like present like, well, I'm going to go with you or anything. He's just like, you should just come or whatever. And I think it's one of those, like, look, we're both in this together. So we just need to, you know, we need to, to group up and, and see what we can do to survive the situation. You know, I mean, he is friendly with them to some degree, but uh, I, I think there's a, in the beginning, I, I think it's less of an interest in each other as it is just, uh, well, there's you, there's me, and there's a bunch of Germans. So two <laughs> of us might survive better than one kind of thing. So, you know, right. misery loves company, get on the boat. <laughs> So all, there's all these zombies, and you and I are the only ones left. So we need to get on the boat and get out of here. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So, and then of course, you know, they they bury her brother. They pack up her some of her belongings, and they hop on the boat and they take off. And of course, his plan is to go find a small island somewhere on the river and like lay low until until everything blows over. Um, and so you know they 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 kind of make a plan as to, as to how they're going to survive this whole thing. And so, you know, he's got a map and he's showing her where they're at in relationship to everything. He kind of explains the whole background, how there's this lake 
And on one side of the lake is the, the British soldiers and, you know, they're trying to get a foothold and to, to, you know, establish their dominance in East Africa. And then there's the other side, which is where the Germans are controlling. And the boat is a German boat. that's kind of like blowing away anything that's in the water. It's and got the so, big six pounder, Matt, the big six pounder on it. Exactly. Um, and of course, you know, Bogart kind of explains all this to her and then you kind of see that like glimmer in her eye. Like she's got this crazy idea and she comes up with this idea of, Hey, let's attack the boat that has this big six pound gun. Well, how best can we do that? Well, in the whole planning situation, we learned that they have, um, gel ignite, which is, you know, used for blasting caps and making, you know, bombs and stuff, even though it's, it, it can be shipped and it does, it's not volatile, but as soon as it gets struck, it can blow up, um, which I thought was interesting the way that they kind of explained it. And so she comes up with the idea of, okay, well, let's get, let's make some torpedoes and we'll attach them to the boat and we'll attack the other boat. Um, I thought it was a pretty clever plan. Uh, I thought it was neat that how she was able to like, not really manipulate Bogart into agreeing to it, but you know, yeah, she Shame. basically manipulated him. Yeah. It was shame. I mean, it's an age-old tactic that that uh, feminine has done to masculine in order to to make them step up to the plate and protect them. You know, I mean, she was like, she was like, your country, your country is in need. What are you? You're not going to do anything. Your country's in need. How can you say that? How can you be a man and not <laughs> respond to your country in need? You know, and. Uh, and that's how it's always been. In fact, in in multiple wars, when when you when uh, guys would be seen not in uniform, not in service, they were they were shamed publicly as a coward, so that they would actually enlist. They wouldn't have to be drafted, and that's right. just how it's been for a long time. But um, but yeah. And and See, she's grief stricken the whole time, you know what I'm saying? So she's like, she's like, you know, my brother's dead. I'm going through this stuff. I got nothing to live for. Let's just take, you know, let's just get our vengeance. You know what I'm saying? Who cares about your ship? <laughs> we gotta we gotta get it back to the Germans. You know what I'm saying? So she's like, we're, we're gonna blow up your ship. And he's like, blow up my ship? What the heck are you talking about? This is crazy. You know? Yeah. I, I I had a complete different takeaway from that whole thing. I you know he, he brings her on board, and, and she originally I, I think she must have been Catholic because that was some serious Catholic guilt she's thrown down <laughs> to him before she became Methodist. But uh, you know I'm 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 listening Anglican, to the back and eh? forth on them. There you go, yeah. Uh, but it, she just starts like giving the business like we should do this and we should do that, and, and I didn't pick up any grief on her as far as the brother went. I mean it was like. Oh yeah, he's dead, and and okay, we'll bury him, and and that's kind of it. Like you don't see her really grief struck. She just starts having these ideas. Like I, I don't, I don't think it's really from a vengeance angle as much as it's more. I, 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 if I had to pick one, I'd say it's more from a patriotic one. But then she's like, you know, we should do this, we should do that, and he's kind of looking at her, and and I get it. If he was kind of a simpleton, and he might present himself a little bit like in the beginning that he might be kind of a bit of a simpleton, but then they start talking about the torpedo thing, which is completely ridiculous to me. Cause I'm like, okay, I'm thinking about this, you know, cause I'm world war two. I'm pretty big buff on world war one. Not so much, but I'm like, there were not a lot of U-boats in world war one. And I, and I looked it up there. Germany had 20. So it's not like U-boat technology was a big thing. And a lot of people knew a lot about him. And she's asking him about the torpedo and he's like, Oh yeah, it does this. It's got gyroscopes, got blah, blah, blah. Like, Okay, this guy's not a simpleton because he just explained more about how a torpedo works than even I know, and I'm kind of a military buff. So, like, you know, his explanation was pretty rock solid. And I'm just like, how does she know about torpedoes, you know, and and, and how they work, and, and how does he have such an in-depth knowledge? It was really weird and out of place to me to some degree, but it was a good plot point. So that's, you know, I give it to, it just had to have that in there for a Hollywood plot, but it seemed ridiculous to me. And then I'm thinking, I brought you on this boat you know, to get you away so the Germans don't get you. And then you come on and you just tell me how we're going to start going to use my boat as a torpedo to blow up this other boat. This is my boat, woman. Like, you're on here. You're safe. We're going to go do what I want to do kind of thing. Like, I just don't see this man who there's no love interest really going on yet. Like, I don't see it on his behalf. And even when she walked up, she kind of messed with her hair a little bit when he walks up. But I don't think it was a, ooh, let me look nice for him. I think it was more just like, oh, I hope I don't look really rough, you know, because I've had these horrible, like, you know, week or two 
since he's been gone kind of thing. And I want to look prim and proper. It was kind of my take on that. So there's not a love interest there where she can kind of manipulate him yet through that. So I just don't see a guy in his position being like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Cause this is what we're going to do. Like I got a bunch of booze and we're going to go find an Island and I'm going to drink my way through this. And you're welcome to stay in the boat and stay safe. Or uh, you can go with the Germans to see how that goes. So it just seemed very weird and out of place for me uh, as far as the whole scene went. And uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, it just seemed wrong. <laughs> That's all I can say. It just <laughs> seemed wrong and out of place and, and just kind of silly. Uh, and then I, I want to say one more thing too, where, you know, Rick is kind of pointing out, it's like, well, it's a matter of national pride. I'd be like, I'm Canadian. I'm not even <laughs> British. So you're, 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 we're not even in this war. So like, you know, stop trying to pull me into your, your war. So and I just, well, on so many levels, it doesn't work. Even though I know the Canadians I, were technically part of the British crown to some extent, but not really. Yeah. Yes and no. I, I, think they were a colony still yeah well they're like we'll put you on the coin but just don't tell us what to do you know i think that's where they were at <laughs> um hey a little quick side note uh according to some of the stuff i looked up as long as it's you know correct charlie was somewhere in his 40s and 50s and rose was 33 at the time in in character characters after. okay so yeah, there's definitely a, a, a an age gap between the characters as well as with the actors. So what what do you think about this scene, Matt? Let, let, let's uh, let's get your take on this. You've had two completely different ones. Now where do you sit? <laughs> well, honestly, when I when I was first watching it, I didn't see it so much as she. I didn't feel grief stricken. Uh, I thought she was coming more from a uh, from a survival standpoint. Like, okay, I really don't want to sit around all day. And watch this guy just get drunk. You know, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go back. I I have other options once I get out of Africa. You know, she's clearly um, somebody that's you know feels as though she she has a higher status in life. So her plan, from my point of view, is that she wants to wants to go home, get back to England, get back to the Midlands, go get away from from this whole situation. I mean, her brother's dead. She's got to find new prospects. She's got to she's got to survive, to get out to get out of there. And I think she tr uses this whole thing to manipulate um Charlie into getting her out of there, getting her, you know, someplace safe. She knows the only way she can get safe is if she can get to that lake and get past that lake. Uh, you know, and that's when she gets the idea of, "Oh, hey, if we have a torpedo." And I think she just uses her her women womanly uh, intelligence to try to get him to side with her. And, and he kind of reluctantly does. I mean, he even, he even does the classic, you know, when he goes to put the, the fuel into the fire, he's throwing that wood and he's talking to himself like that's crazy broads. Just, you know, you know, he, he does like what every fifties, you know, guy does whenever he gets suckered into doing something from the female character is he just talks to himself. Like, I can't believe I signed myself up for this. What am I doing? I'm going to go crazy. Where's my gin, you know, kind of thing turn my boat into a torpedo. I don't know who this woman <laughs> thinks she is. She's sitting in here telling me about, I can't do this, that, or the other. Don't drink that alcohol. Turn your boat into a torpedo. Don't do this. Don't do that. I'm going to throw that woman off the boat. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, when she's asleep, in the drink she goes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, reluctantly, they, they are now on their mission, uh, which then makes this whole thing turn into a riverboat movie. And uh, as I'm watching this, I can't help but think back to that other riverboat movie we saw. And I and I kind of chuckled. I'm like, this is kind of like Apocalypse Now in the Heart of Darkness. You know, we've got some people on a boat going down the river. So we got to have some kind of conflict going on. And I just thought it was it was interesting that to kind of help move the story along to kind of get more of a, a character development. Charlie starts, you know teaching her all about the boat and about the river. And she kind of asked him like, Hey, can you, you know, teach me about all this stuff? And I just thought it was neat that, you know, we've now gone from this. Uh, well, it's, it's always been a river movie, but I just thought it was, it was neat that it, it kind of gave me flashes of apocalypse now as a, as I'm watching this movie from the 1950s. Um, what did you guys think? I mean, we were now in a river boat movie, you know, was there anything that kind of like came back to you? Did this movie kind of inspire, think, make you think of any other movies along the way? Oh, yeah, his, Jungle Cruise, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's it's what I was going to say too. Jungle Cruise. Yeah, apparently that's this is the movie that the Dis Disney got the inspiration for the ride, the Jungle Cruise ride, 
and they the Jungle Cruise movie, um, I think that it more it took a lot more than just inspiration. Um, but a couple things was kind of just wrong with it because Humphrey Bogart is and Charlie is like quite a bit older, not real handsome. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Kind of working class and you know what I mean? Like not, not necessarily, not a, I would say a catch, you know what I mean? Not, not a, not and, a Dwayne Johnson, AKA the rock. <laughs> yeah. He's, he is not a Chad as they say, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Dw- Dwayne so him, the rock. Bro, Johnson. So him. <laughs> <laughs> as you got he that. Is, he is, man. You know what I'm saying? Like you can, you could put, uh, you know, a dirty shirt on him and a weird looking, you know, skipper hat on top of his head and stuff. He's still the Dwayne Rock Johnson. He's got, you know, ripped and chiseled and all that stuff. So I don't know, man. <laughs> uh, we got, we got a I, shirt off of Bogart in this one, you know, <laughs> he was showing off his ribs. He was looking, he was looking all kinds of buff with his ribs and, you know, and, and uh, skinny, gangly arms. I, so you know, that's that's what the women were looking for in the in his, the forties. Uh, his, his, his back arms. sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. But I did um, like in the scene though. I did actually like how they gave some. Uh, they uploaded some information for the audience, some critical information about. Um how the boat navigates, um, how the river in particular, like thing with the, the hippos and the shallows and how, you know, the because the boat is kind of small and it's not super heavy, it can kind of ride over some of the shallows and stuff like that and not get scraped up and mess up the bottom of the boat. And that, that becomes important later as a reason for why the boat doesn't sink in certain places in the uh, movie. And... Um, and there was a little bit of relationship building. I think that was kind of important, especially because you guys have noted that there really hasn't been a spark necessarily just quite yet. And when it does develop, it does seem a little bit sudden. But this is kind of a little bit of that. You know what I mean? Just a little bit. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I think it's funny too that you too funny. that you bring it up that you know that the boat you know that's why it doesn't sink. They actually sunk that boat twice during the making of this film, and they had to bring it back up. <laughs> 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 and yeah that screwdriver thing was crazy too it's like oh they put it in the safety valve and now i have to kick it every once in a while i'm like who would not fix that immediately like now nah, let's just leave this thing a ticking time bomb at any given time it could just <laughs> blow up you know I, that really bothered me a little bit too but i did enjoy though as far as uh, the river you know become the riverboat movie when he talks about like all the perils ahead i mean there really are some great ones i mean you know the rapids just keep getting worse and worse the alligators like that scene where all those alligators just keep coming off the shore at the boat and stuff i'm like holy cow you know you know that's all real i mean they're they're not faking any of that that's not a studio that's africa that's you know crocodiles coming off the shore that they're filming and stuff and i was like oh oh hell no i'm done right there you know and i thought later on too when he's taunting the buffalo you know, or not the buffalo. I'm sorry, the hippos. The hippos. The, the buffaloes. Yeah. The Tonka. Uh, uh, <laughs> you mean the water buffaloes? Yeah, yeah, the water buffaloes. Uh, the hippos. Like nobody in their right mind is going to do that because hippos will attack. Like they're pretty vicious animals, and they they're known to attack boats for you know nothing more than you just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So they're kind of the street gangs of the river, if you will. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, what you doing around here? Me and the hippo guys are going to take you out. Uh, but yeah, I just thought that was interesting that, you know, he spent some time taunting him and stuff. But I thought overall, visually, it was very pleasing. The only thing they didn't throw at him was snakes in this thing. It was the only thing they didn't have, like, flying snakes out of the trees and stuff. But <laughs> um, but I, I enjoyed I, I enjoyed it a lot. And, and I agree. It does remind me of the same, you know, the, the riverboat movie from uh, from Disney that came out with The Rock. Gotcha. Yeah, it, it is, you know, go, go, kind of backing up a little bit with what you said about the, the, the uh, steam engine. You know, it was interesting that he, in my point, I would have thought that he would want to fix it right away. But it, it kind of also helps develop his character to know that he's an alcoholic. He's going to take his time doing anything. He's more concerned about his, you know, 16 bottles of gin that he's got stowed on his on his uh, boat, as well as, you know, he's not going to take the time to fix something. And he even says he just enjoys kicking it. So evidently he's got some frustration issues that he needs to work out. Um, 
but it, it is interesting that he takes his time to, to, to kind of train um, uh, Rose and how to operate the boat to the, to the point where, you know, she's, uh, she's looking forward to tackling those rapids. And uh, I know I'm kind of skipping forward a little bit, but I thought it was kind of neat that when they do actually uh, hit that first set of rapids, like right when it's done, she has like a total like change. Like her, her whole attitude is like, Oh my gosh, that was amazing. That, that like she, you know, she got sprayed by the water and she was like wet about it all and, and, and crazy about it. I mean, so she all of a sudden she becomes an adrenaline junk and she's like fixing her hair. She's like, this is awesome. I want to do it again kind of thing. And I thought that was kind of neat that it kind of got her out of her, her normal character's co cocoon. And it kind of helped her character kind of blossom a little more. And I just thought it was neat that it, it kind of took away that repressed um, exterior she had. And she was able to open up more. And I think that's kind of helped helped her get to that that whole romantic situation or the the, the feelings that she started to have for uh, Charlie. Um, yeah, I like the I like the contrast that happened in the scene before where. I mean, two things to say about the scene before. The one where they're drink, uh, Ch Charlie's drinking the gin. He's fixing to gather a gin and water. And he's straight yeah. up pulling water from the river, man. Like, straight up. And, like, on one end, you could think that her face, she gives some faces of disapproval, right? And on right. one end, you could think that disapproval is coming from the fact that he's straight up drinking this water. But I think it really comes from the fact that he's drinking gin gin honestly i think that she disapproves of him you know getting liquored up you know what i mean yeah and i think that was so, that oh. <clears throat> to see that difference that contrast of what you're saying matt that she kind of opens up a little bit from being this like prim and proper missionary to this like adrenaline junkie man <laughs> see i think that was a twofold thing so i think part of that is the 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 christian missionary in her because you know they're all about uh you know nobody drinking and stuff and i think that still held forward all the way up into world war one uh but i think some of that was really her i mean one she was already super aggravated because you know houston and bogart were drinking a lot offset and she had a, a she had a relationship with spencer tracy uh throughout her life and uh he never would marry her uh, because he was married to another woman that he didn't love, but he was Catholic. So he's like, I, I won't divorce her. I, I can't do that. That's you know, against the tenet of the church. But uh, he was a, a massive alcoholic. And so I think she had to deal a lot with that with him over the years. I think some of that is real repulsiveness in her face. I think, you know, it's, she's channeling her real life dealings with alcohol into this Charlie character. And that look is a look of just disdain for alcohol as a whole. So, uh, you know, it, it played well in the movie although it's weird because you see her just have that look out of nowhere it's like why is, does she look so repulsed by this even from a standpoint of a, of a missionary who's against alcohol I, you know it seemed like an overly dramatic reaction and once i kind of read up about you know a little bit about her past history i was like well this kind of makes a little more sense now so i think she's just just can't stand the side of it you know and and I and I laugh at all the the gin bottles later on that are you know taken care of because I'm thinking that's probably you know Bogart and Houston's real gin bottles that they drank throughout this thing they're just eh, keep them we'll use the props later and we'll write them off as our tax write off or something you know so uh, but yeah I thought that was really interesting and and I think the thing about them going over the falls I think that's Charlie's way of going okay I'm going to stifle this whole conversation. I'm going to take her over these falls. She's going to freak out and that's going to end the rest of this, you know, fantasy she has about blowing up this boat using my boat. And we can finally go park somewhere and camp out for the rest of this war until it's over. And she goes down that thing and she's like, Oh yeah, this was awesome. <laughs> like, she just turns into that adrenaline junkie that we know today. And you know, that people do this every day. I don't even think about it, but for her, like, never seen anything like this before or after. And she's like, I think I want more of this. So, you know, it completely backfires on him. And I think he's just like, oh, son of a bitch. What have I done? I've created a monster. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, they go over the falls or they go over the, the rapids and, and she's all crazy about it. And then, uh, um, 
Oh, you they know had what? A gen- <clears throat> there was one thing, because uh, two things, actually. I don't remember if the rain, I think the rain scene happened before the rapids. Yeah. Okay. So there was, there was the rain scene. But then also something about the tea that I wanted to mention is that it was really cool how uh, the camera showed with the camera angle. They didn't cut it. It showed when the tea was ready, when they were sitting down in the boat, the tea was ready. Like there was this whole process to having tea. You know what I'm saying? Like she fixed up the tea. And then when the tea was ready and was handed and it was you're ready to drink it, she repositioned herself. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but she repositioned herself. She was sitting kind of like more shoulder to shoulder. And then she sat, she repositioned herself so that she was more front, front on front with Charlie. And um, that is typically, you guys may not know this, but typically that is something that females do and not something that males do. When males have conversation, they usually square up shoulder to shoulder. Whereas when females have conversations, they will usually square off front to front. And the only time when guys go front to front is when they're about to do some, something about to go down, when there's some sort of <laughs> confrontation. That's when guys when guys t- speak to each other face to face. You know what I'm saying? But you can't be trusted in that, the guy contact. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. I mean, you think about it. I think about it. I mean, that that is, and it's not like just a you know Rick Dungeon Master thing. This is uh, psychologically um, more than tested, but that that is a fact actually. And I thought that it was pretty cool that they didn't like cut the scene. Like they added, they like kept it in. They, the, the whole scene was, was the way that it was. And it actually kind of shows. And throughout the whole film, this is something else I want to add throughout the whole film. You really get an idea because you don't really see it nowadays, but you in movies, in popular culture, in media, you see a real glimpse of what, uh, strong femininity is and nowadays whenever you have a strong female character which rose is a strong female character you usually see a whole lot more masculine traits and in this one you you get the full-on feminine energy <clears throat> from rose full-on you know what i mean um right and it it comes it manifests most when um they get through the main rapids that's when you really see it man but but this is just one of those things that i wanted to point out also (laughs) when it was raining i thought it was so funny that charlie is like look he's like peeking in he's like trying to get out of the rain so he's peeking in under the canopy and he's like man i'm just getting it's my ship i'm gonna just go in there you know what i mean (laughs) right and then and then rose is like Get the heck out of here. What are you doing? And then she's like, oh, yeah, it's raining. Yeah, you, you can come in. But you didn't ask. But you could come in, though. <laughs> and I, then, I also and thought then it was neat he, that she... she puts the umbrella. Is that what yeah. you were going to say? Then yeah. She puts the umbrella. And I was like, oh, man, how about that? Yeah. That was a nice uh, little touch. The other the other thing, speaking of... of camera angles and, and, and repositioning yourself. I did think it was neat that just before the rain sequence, after uh, after the tea, that uh, they decided they need to take a bath. And so um, Charlie goes off to the front of the boat and leaves um, Rose in the back. And of course, the way the camera is positioned, the uh, steam stack like blocks everything you can see that you know Rose is doing. I thought that was kind of clever. And of course, they... <laughs> They jump into the river to take take a bath, and, uh, and that's when I realized that Catherine Hepburn's got some pretty long legs when she's trying to get out of the boat, and you just see like this leg just like come straight up, and like it's just barely touching the 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 top of the boat. And I was like, man, she's you know she's got some pretty long legs. And then I thought it was clever that uh, you know she, she 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 tells Charlie after he gets on the boat, hey, I can't get back on, and and so she's like, well, close your eyes, and so. You know, he helps her on the boat by quote, closing his eyes and turning his back. And I'm like, all oh, she's she's wearing a slip underneath. It's not like she was, you know, you know, showing all the goods. Come on, that was scandalous back then, Matthew. <laughs> I 
I, I found it more interesting when you see those legs come up the boat and she's trying to get on. I'm like, I don't think she was wearing that before in the water because those are going like down to her kneecaps. And, you know, she's showing almost the whole entire leg trying to get up onto the boat. And then all of a sudden when she gets on, completely clothed. I'm like, hmm, that was kind of weird. But I did enjoy the smokestack cut too. I thought that was really clever. And they, <laughs> they did that just perfect. You know what I mean? It's it's the only way I think they could get away with that because there was some... Uh, uh, there was some studio pushback uh, about this film. Like there's some scenes where the two of them are laying on the bottom of the boat together. And like, Oh no, no, you can't do that. They're, they're not man and wife. You, you cannot have that, you know? So you're going to, they had to recut some of the stuff to make it more proper for the times, you know? And uh, so there, I, I think it was well impressive that they even let them do that whole swimming scene like that and get away with it. In the book, um, the, the relationship that develops is a lot more uh, involved. And that part of that pushback came from like all the way from when, when they were adapting it from the, from the book, because in the book, there's a lot of hanky panky going on and you kind of get the feel that there's a lot more than what you see on the film based on the, the, the change in demeanor between the two of them and the um and the and the names uh, you know that they give each other and stuff like that um but i, I think the prayer at the end sums that all up pretty well <laughs> it, it, it was almost a confession at the end like huh i think maybe there was a little bit more that we got to see going on here <laughs> and you know something else too is uh because it was adapted in uh, the early 50s after World War II, but the book was written, I think it was uh, 30, it was published in 1936, I think, um, that there was a different, a difference in demeanor in how British viewed Germans. So because of that, the Germans in the film were much more aggressive than in the book. In the book, there was, because British, uh, the overall British sentiment of Germans was more of like, almost like, um, not necessarily feeling sorry for them, but definitely not that they were the aggressors of World War One. that they were like, kind of like, you know, they were part of the war, but not necessarily the bad guys necessarily, you know what I'm saying? So, whereas that totally changes in World War Two, obviously, but... Right. Um, so because of that, you, you see a little bit different demeanor from the Germans. And also at the very end, there is a difference. And I guess we'll get to that. I don't know if you guys w looked up on the difference in how the ending in the book is from the movie. But yeah. No, I I, I didn't look anything up with the book. I just kind of stuck with what I saw in the movie. And again, I just saw the movie last night. So <laughs> I did a whole, yeah. lot of re whole lot of research in before uh, coming in. I'm not super familiar with the book, but I did hear that there were three possible endings to this movie from the one that we seen. Um, and they, I don't know if they actually filmed them all or if they were just like rights and rewrites. And then this is kind of how they settled it. Cause I got the, uh, the feeling that uh, Catherine Hepburn was not happy about this. She was really reluctant to sign on. And when she did, she was still kind of uncomfortable with it because I don't think uh, that all the, I don't think the entire script had been written, uh, you know, by John Huston at that point. So she was, you know, really kind of upset that the whole thing wasn't even completed before they started filming. So uh, I don't know exactly where those those three endings fall, but uh, there supposedly was three different ones planned or, you know, at least talked about. Gotcha. Um, you know, speaking of, of, of making the film, I did. I did notice a few things while watching it, and that's uh, you can kind of tell whenever um, they were in the studio because again they did that like rear projection thing, um, and anytime there was like a, a, a shot of them on the river, like a wide shot, you could definitely see that there was only one person in the boat. Clearly, like the other person in the boat, the Catherine Hathaway character was either a mannequin or somebody like tied to the boat as they were going over the falls and stuff. Mm. Um, Actually, so it was a model. It wasn't even the real boat. Like it was a, a large scale model. I think it was uh, like a, uh, like an eight foot model from what I read or something. There's actually the model of it sitting in a restaurant uh, somewhere. I don't remember, like in North Carolina or something. They got it at that restaurant at the front. <laughs> so gotcha. 
Yeah, because yeah, you, you notice the position he's always wrong when you see the two characters. Like, you see the real people in the boat, and then you, you they go to the model that's going over the rapids or whatever. It's like, that's not where they were sitting two seconds ago. There's no way they yeah. could even get across the boat that fast. So, yeah, so they used a couple different scale models to do the rapid scenes and stuff. Gotcha. Cool. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other thing that I, I, I kind of noticed uh, with... with uh, the the force the the force projection in the background is you can kind of see anytime it went over the over the waves and that and that, that water was splashing up you can kind of you can kind of see that when water hits somebody from a wave it kind of hits a little differently than someone taking a bucket of water and splashing it on them and you can kind of see a little bit of that in, <laughs> in the in the scenes that were in the in the studio it's like a bad muppet saying water <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> makeup <laughs> so um but yeah so anyway back to the back to kind of the story is um you know we we talked about you know bogart being drunk and or drinking on in on the set and, and as well as uh his character is big into gin and and i noticed that there was a slight there's a slight turn in the movie when he starts drinking more and he he basically tells tells uh rose off and he's like that's it i'm not taking this any further you know you come in and you take over my boat i didn't agree to do this and he, he basically turns into like this complete asshole um and it, it's it's within his rights because i mean in a way it's like no you took over my boat i'm you know i'm the captain of this thing and i just thought it was interesting that he's like okay <laughs> Great. Now I got to figure out a way to cut this better. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Sorry, I just wanted to show I wasn't typing this time. It wasn't me. Um, but yeah, I just I just thought it was neat that this was like a turning point in the story, as well as their relationship. You know, he's he's your atypical drunk, and I always thought it was funny that like in the 1950s and 60s, whenever you'd see somebody drunk on on in a in a movie, they always start singing, singing like she's. she's sea shanties and and weird like drunk songs and like they're like an atypical this is like did they all go to the same acting class on how to act drunk <laughs> um it, it just seemed very according to what away. tim's saying he wasn't acting <laughs> <laughs> that, that was real yeah i got was on a, a permanent bender for i don't know how many weeks but sir it's it's a sea shanty if you're on a boat the pirates set their tradition you must continue if you're on a <laughs> boat and you're drinking you must sing a good sea shanty if we ever go on a cruise together, Matt, we go drinking, we will sing sea shanties <laughs> together. I promise you. All I'm right. going to go on one with Rick, and I'm going to make Rick drink, and we're going to sing sea shanties together. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> I'll be honest, Matt. I don't have to drink to sing some sea shanties. I actually like that. Yes, that, this is a lie. This is a bold-faced lie, sir. We will be on the open seas. You will drink rum, and we will sing sea shanties together. <laughs> is, is, is Louis Luai a classic sea shanty? Hey, Ken, if you, if you sing it correctly, <laughs> <laughs> the you whole throw point a little Johnny Depp those. in there, and uh, yeah, <laughs> the whole uh, point to what? those is so that you can get the rowing on on a on a, on a rhythm and stuff like that. But nice. uh, you know, here's something. Here's a little something. I didn't really. I thought about it, but then I forgot to write down a note to look it up. So I just looked it up. I thought that it was a little bit queer, as they say back then, that. He was drinking gin. Now, I get it. If he was British, I totally get why he'd be drinking gin because that is a British drink. However, he's Canadian, right? And right. gin was not a common liquor to drink in Canada at that time period. It would have been more uh, uh, chronistic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if he's supplying like, like that. If the miners are all British and stuff, he would be supplying them, oh, so he'd probably yeah. be doing gin. Plus, he's closer to England than he is to Canada, so uh, yeah. you know probably the good access point, to point. such alcohol is, is easier to get your hands on. Point taken. Point taken. Got it. But in that scene where he's drunk, she shames him again because he's like, yeah, this plan sucks. And she's like, you're a coward. So there's that shame again. And then he's like, nah, listen, lady. He's like, listen, Linda. He says, you're an old maid. And it's like, oh, 
you just call her an old maid. And she like, she like does the whole chin thing. Like she about to cry. Like the chin is flinching and stuff like that. And it hurt, man. Back then, that was a, I mean, Tim said it a moment ago. He was like, yeah, she's a spinster. She's an old maid. And he called her out, man. And it was like, dang, that's all that he had to say. He walked away. He kept, well, I think he was singing his song afterwards. That's, he kept singing yeah. the song. And he was like, yeah, it's all good. But she was the one who had the last laugh, right? <laughs> it reminds me of a, a Simpson episode. There's a Simpson episode where uh, Ralph gives uh, Lisa a Valentine's Day card, the I choose you, choose you card. <laughs> and then he keeps calling her his girlfriend after that. And she explodes on him. And she's like, I'm not your girlfriend. And Bart had been taping it. And then they get home and she's feeling bad. He's like, look, you can physically see where you rip his heart out. And as she's like saying it to him, she, you can see they're like, <laughs> You know, like a, you can see every hit into the body, <laughs> and that's kind of how Catherine Hepburn is like. And you're an old spinster. You just see her going, <laughs> you know, it's just she's taking those hits. You know, it's just like, oh, you've you've pierced my heart and soul, you horrible man. So, yeah, yeah. So she she played that well. You could see the the pain. Every word was was hitting its mark for sure. But she gets her she gets her revenge and and dumps out all those uh, those wonderful gin bottles. Gordon's gin. It printed right on the side of the box and yes. just dumping them out. And I, I did think it was kind of neat. You, 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 you kind of see one of the, one of the bottles goes over. And then as they pan out, you see a long line of empty gin bottles going down the river. And I, I, <laughs> I, I couldn't help but think of those, some of those classic Tom and Jerry cartoons when they would show us something similar, you know, they, they throw a bottle on the river and then you see this long line of, of bottles. So, <laughs> It's like it was like the Snickers one, but Snickers wasn't around yet. Not going anywhere for a while. Have a Snickers, like not going anywhere for a while. Have some Gordon's gin, you know. It's just, you know, <laughs> and every bottle was floating upwards, so you could see that label. So yeah, Gordon's definitely got their plugs in on that one. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, and of course, you know, poor uh, poor Charlie's like, oh no, don't do that. And he's he's thoroughly hungover. Um, and then of course, you know, we cut away and we we come back and you know maybe maybe the next morning, a couple hours later. And, you know, Charlie's sitting there shaving, he's getting cleaned up and, and we kind of, he kind of works his way into an, an, an apology. And this whole scene of him, like working his way into an apology to kind of get back on, on Rose's good side. It immediately made me think of like some of those classic 1990s romantic comedies when like the two main characters would have a fight and they wind up making up like in the kitchen when she's like doing the dishes or something. I'm like, this is, you know, take it, Take it from the 1990s to the 1950s in a riverboat. It's it's basically the same kind of concept. It's like the stories really don't don't change that much. The settings are a little different, but yeah, there's still that romantic kind of trying to to break down the walls of of anger and and uh, looking to get that apology going. And she eventually does uh, does accept his apology, and he's you know he does agree that he'll continue down the river. And then uh, that's when we get another another neat action scene coming up and that's uh that's with the uh the the, the fort for the, the germans have and uh, i thought it was kind of neat that we got some tension going on between the two of them and then they kind of like they, they kind of resolve that problem and then we get immediately into another tent tent spot where you know they're they're approaching this uh this fort and uh what did you guys think of that that whole fort sequence where they're they're trying to get past the german soldiers I thought it was cool. Um, and for the record, I, I went back and I played back the scene where she's telling him the plan. He did not promise. That did not happen. <laughs> she's like, you promised. And I was like, did he? I was like, did I mean, you know, I think that's part of the I think that's part of the whole like you were saying before, like manipulation and stuff like yeah. being like, no, nah, man, you promised. And it's like, did he promise? I don't even remember. And I just saw it 30 minutes ago. You know what I mean? So I had to go back and I took a look at the scene. And no, he was kind of like, man, OK, that was like his response when she's like, we're going to. All right, here's the plan. We're going to make these torpedoes. We're going to put them on the boat. Your boat's going to be a torpedo. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to we're going to be able to take down the Luisa. And his response was like, man, all right. Like, that was his response. So when she's like, you promised, it was like, nah. Now, he did not promise, but that's part of the manipulation. You know what I mean? And as far as yes. the German scene go, 
Um, yeah, I took my phone out and I used the Google Translate to try to get as many <laughs> words as I could out. And they were when he when they first showed up in the scene, and you can see the Germans looking at them, being like, "What's going on?" They were saying, "Why don't they? Why don't they uh, uh, like land?" not land but uh make land and why don't why don't they have their light on or something like that that was was something like uh why don't they have their lamp on or something like that like that was they were questioning what they were doing that's why the confusion so apparently there was something that was supposed to be going on that wasn't going on and maybe that's why they were like okay well they ain't one of us cuz they ain't doing you know the certain thing or whatever something that was my gist of it i don't speak german so I don't know, and I try. I played that sucker like, I uh, must have been five, six, seven times, man, <laughs> with the Google train. I had the phone or the, the phone right next to the speaker. I had the speaker all the way up, but I couldn't get it all, man. I, I barely could get anything, honestly. But it was it was pretty cool. It was a little bit of action and stuff like that, so it was cool. And the thing that Rose had said did come into play. She's like, oh hey, the sun's gonna be in their eyes. And at the very end of the scene, when one of the German, I don't know, officers, captain, whatever, br- busted out with a uh, uh, rifle that had a little scope on it, um, right before he took the shot, you know, the sun kind of got into his eyes and he, he was not able to make the shot, take the shot, you know? Yeah. So I thought that was kind of cool. And, yeah, and it was showed- and it showed a little bit of his expertise of being like a Mr. Fix-It, like a handyman, you know, in the middle of the scene. So that was cool. Gotcha. So I, I thought it was interesting leading up to that, the whole fight on the boat and stuff. And this is another one of those where it's it's really bad. It goes from one moment from him being completely so drunk that he can't even get up to try to save his alcohol to the next minute he's shaving and polishing up his, you know, basically all the brass parts on that, you know, that uh, – steam engine of his and stuff it was just too too weird i mean everybody's had a hangover seeing somebody with it you don't bounce back that quickly you know? so it was very clumsily done i thought but i did enjoy the fight between them because then he's like trying to kind of give her some compliments because he knows he's done her you know he, he's really hurt her and because you know uh bart played the replay back for her or for him and he's like oh <laughs> crap i really did do some bad stuff to her uh so you know he's like oh and he's trying to say nice things to her and this that and the other and she's just completely ignoring him giving the silent treatment and i was like wow you're right it, it rings true doesn't matter what decade this is this is the argument and he's the guy's just trying his best to dig his way out and he's finally at the end he's like wow what, what do you want from me tell me what i did wrong i don't even know like it was just you know it had that feel to it she's like you want to really know why i'm mad it's not even because of what you're thinking you know so i'm like oh man that that whole conversation just transcends the ages for sure uh, so I, I thought that was well done outside of the, you know, recovering from, uh, you know, a stupor in a matter of hours, you know, especially for somebody as heavy of a drinker as he is. Uh, and then when they got to the, uh, to the fort and they're getting ready to go. And, and I think this again, where Rick's like, did he really promise or no, he never did. He, he was just doing, he's doing that typical tactic as so many guys do, you know what? I'm just going to appease her for now. And then we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. You know, I'll have to like, you know, fight that battle once we're there. And I think that's what he's doing. Cause I, th- I think he kept hoping, you know, Oh, we'll go through the rapids and then she won't, won't want no part of this. Oh, uh, well, she really enjoyed that. Well, we'll let her get shot at a little bit. Maybe that'll change her mind. Well, I guess not. You know? So I think he kept hoping along the way that something was going to be like the, the bridge too far for her. And she's like, you know what? This is a bad idea. We should stop. So I think that was what he was gambling on he, because he never really committed himself, but he never really said, Oh, hell no. So, uh, and that's on him to some degree, but uh, I thought it was interesting. Then you got the the Germans up there, and, and you know I I didn't sit with my Google Translate. I just kind of took it for face value that you know look they are not doing something like they're supposed to, and so the German guy's like ah shoot them you know. And then you got those conscripts, which you know shows that you know those guys are not well trained. They're just they're having a good old time. They're trying to like one guy can't even work the bolt on his gun. He's trying to you know chamber around and stuff. And they're just they're just taking pot shots. It's like it's like watching a bunch of you know uh, Tuscan Raiders you know shoot at pod racers basically. <laughs> and uh, so the Germans like give me that gun or whatever you know. Which and then I'm looking at the gun. I'm like those are British Enfields. Those are not even like you know uh, German guns. So I thought that was kind of interesting too that they were using British guns, but. Uh, you know, and so he, he's taking his time. He's going to, you know, he's got the scope on it. So he's going to, uh, 
you know, take aim and, and take the, the captain out. And then the, as she pointed out, the sun gets in his eyes. So very fortuitous for him because he was about ready to take one to the head. And uh, so it, it was, a, it was a fun scene, very interesting. And, I, but I, that, that, that scene, you knew it was coming because he already said it was going to. So you kind of expected it. It wasn't that exciting. Uh, overall, I thought the argument was far more entertaining uh, than the actual like shooting at the vote was. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I thought it was neat that we went from like a romantic comedy scene right into an action scene. I mean, you know, this is this is well before, you know, uh, movies like Six Days and Seven Nights where you kind of have development of romance in with some action. <laughs> yeah. OK, <laughs> it's the only movie I could think of at the time that uh, it has to do anything to anything <laughs> like this, <laughs> that action movie with a rom- romantic comedy built inside. Um, so yeah, it's for those it, who it cannot was see neat how what I can see on the stream. <laughs> Tim, Tim, it, Tim shows his minor disapproval to those films. <laughs> <to the film. laughs> well, not to, I would say to that film, not Harrison Ford's yeah. best. Um, but yeah, so uh, so yeah, so we 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 see this 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 action sequence or this adventurous sequence, and you know they they. They try to build in, build up the suspense with the, all the pot shots taking out the the main steam line, and so Bogart's got to fix it. And you know the hero saves the day, and they're able to get past the the um, get past the fort. And of course, then you also get to see like some crocodiles and stuff, and you can kind of see see some worry in in Humphrey Bogart's eyes. But you know, again his whole like tim said his whole his whole thought process has, has backfired you know uh rose is like feeling so much more confident now that they've gotten past that that thing that she's looking forward to tackling the next big obstacle you know she's she has hope to to, to keep moving forward as as rick had said earlier about the difference between hope and despair in this in this movie um so yeah i just i think it's neat that they they're able to get past this hurdle you know, and through sheer luck and through the fact that, you know, she called it with the, with the sunlight, you know, blinding the guy's sight to where he couldn't take the kill shots on uh, Charlie, that they were able to get past this, this difficult situation. And then of course, you know, once they get past that, then they get to some more rapids and some more wide stunt doubles and rear projection and, and traveling through. And, and after this, that's kind of where we get another romantic moment and and you know everything else seemed like it was slowly leading up to this and it it isn't till like this point that we kind of get from my point of view a little overacting from from humphrey bogart in the whole you know i'm i'm so happy to be alive and and i'm immediately like pawing all over um my my female romantic interest that it just it seemed again it felt a little forced to me I, I don't know what you guys felt watching this if if it was it seemed like a very forced reaction to to, to living through the rapids and getting shot at um you guys got any uh, any opinions on that how about you tim well what i'm getting from you matt is i keep hearing you say the word forced so i think what you're trying to insinuate is that maybe george lucas wrote this love story <laughs> and uh <laughs> and uh the force wasn't with him yet again <laughs> trying to write romance uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy force because it, it happens right after they survive, you know, getting shot up or whatever. No, it's when they go over the second rapids and they're all yeah. excited. Right. Yeah. And, and I don't think it's, it's really Bogart's character. I think it's Hepburn when she's like, Oh, hip, hip, hooray. I'm like, hip, hip, hooray. Who jumps up and says that after you survive, you know, <laughs> some rapids and stuff. It's just seemed weird to me though. Yeah. Like, the way they're kind of rejoicing and then they kind of fall into each other's arms and so, stuff. I mean, I get the, you know, falling into each other's arms because, you know, heck, we just survived this crazy rapid thing and, you know, like we're just happy to be alive. That part I got and they have the awkward moment where they embrace and stuff. So that part was good, but there was a few in there like the hip hip parades where I'm like, okay, a little too much. Stop, you know, <laughs> get George out of the writing room, bring somebody in to clean this up. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's where you start to get the clumsy love story that's forced into, into it. And you can kind of see it. It was, they were leading up to it, but in a, they should have done it in a much better way. They were, they were like, you know, it was like subtle, subtle, subtle in your face that it was just, yeah. you know, and it, it needed more time to breathe, I think, or, you know, it should have been spread out a little longer, but we're there. And I didn't think to some degree they, they addressed that when she's like, uh, 
what's your name? Like she only knows first name. She yeah. up until that point, she's just calling him, you know, Mister Allnet. You know, so it's like, uh, my love, what is your name? It's like, mm, yeah, you guys might be going a little too quick. So, oh, you know, dear. Let, oh dear, dear, yeah, oh, dear, oh, dear, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, it's just all kinds of weird and clumsy. How about you, yeah, Rick? Yeah, I think that. What do you think of the, yeah, the I, whole? I, I think that. You know, <clears throat> if it if it was kind of done more in the modern era of filmmaking, there I think there would have been a lot more of not only lead up, but I think there would have been more than lead up. Honestly, it didn't even need that much lead up. What it needed was, I mean, you know what they say. Uh, not that I necessarily subscribe to this, but it takes skin to win. You know what I mean? And there was it's a pg movie you know what i'm saying it's a pg movie so they couldn't show anything like not necessarily that it had to be you know uh you know sec like highly sexual content and stuff like that but there was a little bit there was a accidental heat of the moment kind of kiss with some awkwardness which you know if there was feelings there then I mean, I didn't read the book either, but I would imagine that there probably wasn't that awkwardness after the kiss. It probably just kind of naturally progressed into something that was a lot more than a kiss. And if that were to happen, then I think it would have been a lot more believable. You know what I'm saying? Not that you have to like show a bunch of crazy stuff, but I, I think you needed to show more than just a kiss and a hug. You know what I mean? Yeah, and uh, I I think that's where that all comes from. You know what I mean? I mean, it don't have to be full on Game of Thrones type of stuff, but <laughs> you know, it probably need to be more than what it was. I, I think <clears throat> what we're missing is the fifties leg lift. That would have sold it. Just the fifty, you know, she got to lift that one leg you know, when they kiss, and that, that sells the whole thing. Then, <laughs> oh yeah, that's true love. Now, yeah, she got the leg up. It's true love. We're there. The leg pop, nice. Yep. <laughs> um. Yeah, and then, you know, Tim called it, you know, like after this whole uh, love scene and they, you know, they 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 get past the rapids, they anchor off to the side and they kind of like, you know, take account of everything and we get this like cutaway love scene and the next thing we come back to is, you know, she's uh, she's making him tea and she's calling him dear and she doesn't even know his first name and that's kind of like kind of get more of the introduction of the other names and uh it, it's it's interesting that you know they they kind of they kind of talk a little bit about you know maybe kind of staying there because you know they're they're kind of in love and uh they, they like the spot but they just decided to continue on you know they realized they need to get out of there and uh, well, that of course is is so so with that that particular aspect that's another reason why i think that her plan really kind of did come from a place of like you know, maybe there wasn't a whole lot of grief after the brother died, but there certainly wasn't a whole lot of reason to live. <clears throat> so once there was that, then all of a sudden she's like, well, you know what? That plan really, I, I really didn't want to do that anyways. You know what I mean? And then he's like, no, nah, man, we're committed. Let's go ahead and do this. I think we can yeah. do it now. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, that that's going circle around back to the whole plan switching up thing. I, I still think that it had to do with maybe not so much grieving, but nothing to live for kind of thing, you know? And that whole, whole thing of like hope and despair, you know, that was a bad decision. That's a whole bad decision to begin with, man. I mean, anyone in their right mind can be like, yeah, I'm not going to use my boat as a torpedo. That's, that's probably not a good <laughs> idea. You know? I mean, it was before kamikaze missions, right? Right. Um, so yeah, then uh, then of course we get that whole that whole sequence that Tim had mentioned earlier about Bogart imitating the wildlife and you know being silly on the boat and you can kind of see that they're 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 tr the storyteller is trying to tell us a little more about how they're how they're trying to fall more in love and and get to know each other better and you know there's a lot of playful moments happening and then uh, then of course uh, we get the final waterfall rapid sequence. And then that's where we learn a little bit more about the boat after it's gone over the falls and they've survived and things have just kind of like wrecked like crazy. You know, the, the, the tarp is no longer on top of the boat 
and they managed to break the shaft of the of the propeller as well as one of the the propellers now i don't know about you guys you know i'm a little mechanically inclined but i don't see myself going under the river which happens to be like the clearest looking river i've ever seen in a movie and mm -hmm. try to take the shaft drive shaft out of a boat as well as the propeller that's some pretty clever stuff they had going on there um well, not, not only that, but you lose your toupee when you're uh, down there, you know, uh, trying to take the shaft off or in the uh, <laughs> propeller. Right. <laughs> Apparently, Bogart was a little bald and he had a toupee. And if you watch real close, you see it kind of come up. So <laughs> Nice. I, well, I what about you, Ricky? I think that that is totally far-fetched. Like the whole, that's a bunch of nonsense, man. Especially like when they showed the welding thing. <laughs> I was like... I was like, what, man? They had a little fire, and then they put the two, like, heated pieces of metal together, and then cut two, now it's back together. It's like, that ain't how that works, man. <laughs> but whatever, whatever. Me, personally, I thought the most important part of that scene had to deal with that hope and despair. After the, after the waterfall, he's like, man, we're washed up, both figuratively and literally. And she's like, nah, man, we could do it. You could weld the thing, and you could go and get this thing. And she's asking questions. She's like, "Oh no, no, you could do that. You're you're like a real good handyman. You could fix things, and you could do. I've seen you do blah 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 blah. Like you could totally do it." She's using this. I mean, today we have a problem with feminine characters in movies. Not that it's a problem to have a feminine character in a movie, a strong female character, but it's a problem when all the strong female characters are perfect as they are. And they're hyper masculine and they do nothing wrong. Everything happens and everything that they do, everything they touch is going to be 100% awesome. And there's not going to be any conflict. And any conflict, they're just going to go ahead and take a hammer to it because they got no other tool in the toolbox. And in this particular case, she wasn't like, well, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to get down there and I'm going to fix it, even though I don't know a, a dang thing about fixing propellers. That's not what happened. Today, that's what would happen. But back then, <clears throat> the strong female character was like really exhibiting feminine nature and was like trying to make push the their man into becoming better than seeing the best traits in themselves that they themselves cannot even see. So she believed in him that he could make this happen. She believed in him that he could fix it and then they could actually, you know, continue on. And then he was like, no, nah, man, this is impossible. And she kind of convinces him that, no, we can. OK, yeah, maybe we can do this. Maybe there is a way that we can do this. So it is far fetched, but I don't think that's the most important aspect of this whole scene. I think the most important aspect of it is is that this story from looking at it from today looking back this is this is something that i think a lot of people need to watch to see what is feminine energy what is feminine nature and what type of strengths do females have naturally like in 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 their own self and this is it right here this is it and it and it and the magic happens you know and i think that is what is important to take away and it's that's an interesting. It's an interesting take because I, when I watch it, you know, she's like, "You can do it. You can go down there and do this." And, and I was kind of like you when she's like, "You, we'll just pull the shaft out and we'll go do a little forged <laughs> fire up on the on the shore." And I was just like, "What point is he gonna look at and go, woman, are you on crack?" Like, like <laughs> you know. And I think about today, I'm like, "There's guys that pull their car, or you can't even fix your car on the side of the road, let alone fix an entire shaft and a propeller and a boat in the middle of a dang jungle." But you know, she convinces them to do it. But the thing I, I you know, I, I think she's a little more optimistic sometimes. And it, but I will give her credit. She got down there and she's, he's like, I can't get this prop off. And she gets down in, in the water with him and goes underneath and helps him push that off. So she does help him and supports him in this endeavor. So she's not completely like, you can do this. And I'm going to sit in the boat and drink tea, you know. So she did get down there and help. And I thought that was, <laughs> yeah. that was pretty awesome that she did that, you know. And I'm watching it and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm thinking about it because, okay, I have watched a lot of Forge and Fire. And I'm like, yeah, if you built a fire, you had a big enough rock, you get that shaft in there and you had a hammer, 
you could probably hammer that thing fairly straight. I, I'm going to give him that one. But I'm right with you when I'm watching that whole like, okay, now I'm going to take these two pieces of the prop and I'm going to forge weld them together by hammering them together. Hell no, that's not going to hold up at all. Like it just, you have to get that stuff so hot and you have to hammer it in and then you got to quench it. And all they have is water to quench. And usually when you quench with water, it causes stress in the steel and causes that stuff to pop and break and, and crack and stuff. You know, it's just like, that, that's not going to happen. Like that's not real. Plus it's so thin already, you know. So I call shenanigans in that one, but it moves the story forward and it does, you know, show them triumphing over all these obstacles. So again, movie magic, um, you got to give them a little leeway on that kind of stuff because there's so many movies, as Julie would point out, if they did everything the way you think they should or they follow the logic of how everything should work, then there wouldn't be a movie. So uh, sometimes right. you just have to take movie magic and, and just go with it and like, okay, I'm going to accept that so because I want to see how the story continues. But uh, yeah, like yeah, explosions in Star Wars don't make sounds. But they right, do right, Star exactly. Wars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, my yeah. question is if they still had gin to quench the fire, would that would have been would have caused it to not pop? Usually it's oil. You have to have like a, a heated oil that you put it in, and then you have to get it up to a certain temperature. There's like a perfect temperature. Too hot. Or too cold, and you're, it's not going to quench right. You have to get it like where it's, and it's you got to be able to see it. It's got to be like this, like kind of orangish looking, like perfect orange, and you get it in there and do it. But water is like the worst thing you can use to quench, and it, it'll usually cause that stuff to just fracture all over the place. So, gotcha. and it's it's hard to hammer two pieces of steel and force them to remarry themselves again. I mean, I've never done it, but I've watched, like I said, I've watched eight seasons of Forging Fire. So I've seen those guys do it. And I'm, I'm yeah, there, there's no way, especially something that thin. I'm, I'm not seeing it. Riveting, if you could have riveted it together or, or you know, because she's like, well, you could weld it. And he's like, you know, he's laughing because he's like, you need a welder. But like maybe a ribbit gun, if you had a, the ability to drill holes and then kind of rivet it together, might have done the trick. But outside of that, I don't see you being able to make that, you know, that, that roadside or I guess shoreside repair so easily, right. you know, <laughs> and I, even triple a showed up there like, no, no, we're not fixing that here. It dry dock. It goes. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 A little suspension of belief, but you know, like you said, it had to, it had to move the story forward. Um, and then of course, you know, I, I have to agree with Rick that, uh, you know, Catherine Hepburn's portrayal of Rose, you know, as a strong female character that, yeah, this is that, that I, I totally agree with everything that Rick had said with, with the classic strong character, you know, she was using multiple tools in her toolbox. Whereas with modern day characters, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to poke fun at Marvel, but like uh, the, the last Captain Marvel movie, it was like, there was three main characters that were supposed to be strong leads and it was, they were all, they were just solving problems by just hitting it. And yeah, I think that, the whole fact of being able to write an intelligible female character has been lost in, in today's storytelling. Um, so that's my, that's, that's my soapbox and I'll, I'll, I'll step aside from that. Um, one thing that, that we kind of haven't mentioned throughout the movie and I, I kind of noticed it in the, in, in these last couple scenes is, is just the music, you know, the, the orchestral music. It seemed like whenever there was like a point where, uh, they were kind of to some kind of trouble, like whether it was the rapids or the or the animals or something. There was like these little notes of of, of orchestral music that kind of gave you that feeling that there's going to be something happening, you know, something that's about to happen. And there was a few spots, like when they were welding, where it the music kind of suggested that it was going to fail. And I just thought it was kind of weird that it was it was kind of jarring in some spots, but in other spots it kind of flowed nicely. Um, any, you guys have any thoughts on, on, on the music adding to the, the feeling of the movie? Yeah, I think that it was really cool, man, uh, throughout most of the thing, most of the film. And there were there were spots where it definitely struck me. But when I thought about it, not all of them, but in a lot of those spots, I think that it was the music was uh, a little bit sounded a little bit off to tip the audience that there was that one of the characters was feeling a bit off with what was going on in the scene. Cause like, I can't remember exactly specific, but I, I remember one, one point where I noticed that the music changed suddenly. And then I was like, wait, what? And then it, it, it shocked me and it, and it jarred me out of the film slightly to really take a look at the scene, like, am I missing something? And then there was. It was something with Rose had 
changed her demeanor. And I took a look and I was like, oh, so um, I thought overall, I thought that the score was really cool. It was really, really well done, I think, uh, for the most part. Gotcha. <clears throat> How about you, Tim? Any thoughts on the music and the the feeling you got from it watching some of these episodes? The score is really good. I mean, it, it's exceptionally good. And a lot of the 50s movies really do have decent scores. I thought sometimes the music was almost more intense than what the visual was you were seeing on screen. It was just mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, I feel very tense at this moment because that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to, you know, kind of make you feel tense at certain times and other emotions at others. But it's like, and then you're watching the screen. I'm like, I don't know why I feel as tense as I do because this does not feel like it should be this <laughs> heightened, you know. So it was it, like it was a little bit of conflicting. Like, you know, my brain's telling me one thing. My eyes are like, what? No, no, not at all. This is not a big deal, you know. So, but, uh, but overall, it was very well done. You know, I, I just, yeah, it just didn't always match well. You know, we, you get that like perfect marriage in so many other movies like E.T. and Star Wars and Raiders and stuff. It's spot on. But, you know, earlier in the, you know, back in the day, I, I, I think they wrote great music, but it just, they, they, like some of those, I know they're watching the movie while they're writing the music. And I think back in the day, it was like, okay, we're going to write music and then we just insert it in. So, right. uh, I mean, I could be wrong on that, but I think that happened a lot. You know, they're just like, okay, we need to write a score for this. And then they just kind of fit it in where it needed to go kind of thing. They would describe the scene and then they'd kind of write something accordingly. But, but I enjoyed the music nonetheless. It was very, very well done. It was a great score. Well, and, and the reason, the other reason why I bring up the music now is because we get, a 1950s montage as they leave the last rapids and we get to see the boat going through the river and everything's all serene and they got some nice music in the background i'm like this feels like a montage to me all i'm waiting for is like a classic 80s you know you know someone doing push-ups or some kind of like 80s <laughs> music in the background kind of thing and then, of course, you know, as they're going through after the montage to, to show progression of them going down the river, they decide to hold up alongside of a bank to, to for the night and uh, they drop anchor. And then, like, almost immediately, like the film is in covered with these insects that I think are supposed to be mosquitoes. But it was like within like three seconds, boom, yeah. there's all these mosquitoes. And I'm like, that doesn't seem natural to me. Um but again, maybe maybe time in Africa goes by quickly. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, that's that's just one scene that just kind of like it kind of pulled me out of the movie a little bit. And it's like so now we we can't shore up anywhere, and you kind of get this this plot point of okay, they have to keep going. Um, and they even said that they would like drop their anchor further out so that it has a longer line away from the bank. But I don't know, I just it seemed a little off to me. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on the sudden attack of the killer insects? Yeah, it, it was way too quick. Like it was just like no bugs, a billion bugs. But I, I, I was fascinated with it though. Nonetheless, I'm just sitting there and I'm staring like, this is an amazing shot. Like I'm just watching. I'm like, how did they do this? You know, and I'm just looking at it, looking at it. And I finally determined it's somebody. They took a, like a marker on a glass plate, drew a bunch of bugs put it in front of the camera lens and they're moving it back and forth. So that's why all these bugs appear because they had to put the glass plate with all these little markings on it and then they're just moving it around back and forth. And so, you know, that's why there's like zero to like a gazillion bugs, you know, that was the movie magic that they did to do it. But I was like, that's a really great effect. You know, I mean, it just too bad. They couldn't have figured out. I kind of, you know, a couple guys with a really big long sheet of glass where they could have kept walking with like a few dashes. It got more and more and then, they hit it again, <laughs> and then they're shaking it. And then as they move away, they could kind of walk it back off. But you know, but for the time, I thought it was a kind of a cool effect, but it was a, it was very abrupt and in your face. Yeah, I, th I think if you were if you were to make a theater adaptation, it'd be something similar. You'd have nothing, and then all of a sudden, you'd have somebody in the back shaking some maraca or something to make it <laughs> make or a, or some sort of buzzing instrument or something like that to to let the audience know that there's mosquitoes there, you know. So yeah. Got it. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, then, uh, oh, and we also forgot, I also forgot to mention that, uh, Hepburn thinks about jumping in the, in the river and there's a crocodile that comes in and, and Bogart's <laughs> like, no, don't jump in. There's a, there's a crocodile. Um, so yeah, we, 
we could have had we could have had uh Hepburn uh bait there for a minute or two. Um so then made uh, me itchy. Made me really <laughs> itchy watching it. Yeah. Uh let's see. So then uh then they get past the mosquitoes. The river is super crazy. And then they get to this area that's kind of like, it reminded me of the Everglades in Florida with all the sawgrass. And they're trying to navigate this area that they try to find the tributary to get out of this, this very lowland swampy area. And then they get kind of stuck and they shut off the steam engine. And now they're using the ore to kind of push their way through. And I think this is where we get to that, that scene that kind of reminds me of the movie stand by me and, Charlie has to jump out of the boat and he has to pull the boat and save everybody the Jack Lane way and pull the boat through the, through the swamp. <laughs> and, uh, and he gets so far and finally he gets to the point where he can now get back on the boat and it's kind of floating a little bit. And we get the scream from, uh, from Rose and it, and it turns out that, uh, that, uh, we, we mimic the scene from stand by me where, he takes off his shirt and there's leeches everywhere. And I'm like, kind of gave me the, the heebie jeebies and uh, uh, kind of curious what you thought, Tim. Cause I mean, I know you had mentioned it earlier about the, about him showing off his, his well-toned skinny abs and, and everything, you know, what, what was your thoughts on, on this whole situation? Oh, I, I can't stand this scene. I mean, it just, I, I hate leeches. That's one of the few things in the world that you get one on me and I'm running around like my hair is on fire. Like, get it off, get it off, you know? Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe Humphrey Bogart felt the same way about it. He actually wanted them to use rubber leeches. And uh, uh, Houston's like, no, he brought in an actual guy that had a tank of leeches like it, it, to the filming set and he was threatening to use them. So that re Impulsiveness that you see in Bogart is real because it made him very queasy to see these things, and he thought that they were really going to put him on him. And the close-up scenes where you see the leeches attached to bodies, actually the trainer or the guy who the trainer of leeches, I guess if that's the thing, <laughs> puts them on his body so they can film him pulling them off or whatever. But yeah, so he was completely unsettled by this. But I, I think you know, and, and then there's a couple other things about the scene where he comes, you know, when he comes out, she's helping him get it off, she's, and he's like, "No, don't pull him off because they'll poison me." And she gets the salt, which is brilliant. Again, she's thinking, she knows like salt removes them and that kind of stuff. So I thought that was great, you know, and then he takes off his shirt and she's salting them down and he lifts up his legs. And I'm like, oh no, at this point, modesty is over. I'm pulling the pants off because we're making sure these things are <laughs> nowhere where they're not supposed to be, you know, totally they're coming off, you know? And, uh, so once they get it off, you know, he's shaking and stuff and, and you see that repulsiveness and then they try pushing the boat and then he realizes there's no way we're pushing this boat. We are too bogged down. And he has that look and they share that glance. And I think this is one of the most powerful moments in the movie where she looks at him and he looks at her. And she realizes this man is going to have to get back in this water on something that makes him that so vile to him. And he's going to do it because he needs to get them where they need to go. And he gets back in that water, just doesn't bother putting the shirt and stuff back on and starts pulling that boat. And a couple minutes later, she's in the water right next to him. She's like, if he has to do it, I'm going to do it too. So they're both getting these leeches just attached. And I thought that's a powerful moment. That's, you know, that's a woman standing by her man, you know, and she's like, if he has to do this and he's willing to do this for me, then I'm going to show him the support. I'm going to get the water. I'm going to share this horrible experience so we can get, you know, we can get to what we need to get to, you know, together. So I thought it was super powerful. It's just one of the most amazing moments of, of, a, a sh you know, just a shared moment between a couple where it's like, if you're going to do this, then I'm going to do this with you. We're going to get through it together, no matter how bad it is. So it was super powerful. Yes, I, I, I agree. It was definitely a, a partnership moment. How about you, Rick? What, what was your I thoughts on this? I can't agree more. That, that is, uh, yeah, yeah. Pretty much everything that Tim said, I, I nearly a hundred percent agree, except, uh, I don't have the same aversion to leeches, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look at them like that necessarily. There are certain, uh, you know, bugs and uh, little creepy crawlies and stuff like that that definitely I'm not down with. But leeches, I don't know. I don't have the same aversion. But I, res I definitely empathize with the aversion that the character and the actor both have to these leeches. And when something like that is going on, like, uh, I 100% agree with Tim. Like that really shows something powerful in how Rose handles the situation, sticking to her man. You know, like yeah. that's that's something else. 
Yeah. And of course, you know, him getting hit by the leeches and, and just the, the sheer exertion of, of trying to pull this boat through that swamp area to the point where he gets so tired. And he, I mean, he's like on the verge of, of, I'm guessing that he got some kind of blood poisoning or something. I mean, he was just, he was beat and worn out to the point where he couldn't go any further. And they're just kind of like beach the boat and get back inside of it. And he's laying down. And I think that's where we get the, the true moment of where we see that, um, Rose loves him so much because, you know, they're at, they're at their wits in, they can't get out of the swamp area. They don't know which way is, is out. Um, they're just frustrated and tired and worn out. And he like kind of falls asleep and doesn't really wake up. And uh, she's sitting over him and, and, and she prays. And I think this is, this definitely shows again, a character moment for her to, to see that, you know, she's, she has the hope that they could live, but she puts her hope in, in God and she, she prays to God to, to help them out. And then we get the scene where it just starts raining but just before we get the rain sequence, the camera kind of pulls out and we see that they're only probably a hundred yards away from the mouth of the river. I mean, they're, they're so close, but they're just, they're out of energy. They're out of, of, of power to do it on their own. And they, they just reach out to God or she reaches out to God and asks him for help. And, and of course the movie depicts that wonderfully with uh, the rainstorm that comes. And uh, it, it's just kind of neat that the rain lifts the boat up floods the entire area and that they can now safely get into the river and it's it's uh charlie that wakes up and and puts two and two together and he's like all surprised and he he uh he lets rose know and and the, now they're they're happy you know they're they're back they've made it to the lake they're out of the river everything's coming up uh mill house <laughs> and uh <laughs> yeah and so uh what did you guys think of 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 that sequence where you know she's just over uh, standing sitting over charlie uh i i would have to say that uh this this harkens back to what i said with the hope and despair she has seen what happened to what uh despair did to her brother and it's about to happen to charlie he this dude i mean basically nothing killed his her uh brother it was really it was nothing it was despair it was it was you know kind of like uh was that movie the never ending story it was like the nothing killed him you know and in this particular instance it's the same thing that despair is about to kill charlie he you know whether he's getting sick from malaria or he's you know got poison from leeches or who knows what in general it's despair so I didn't think of it as a prayer to God kind of thing that opened up the, the heavens that allowed the rain to come down. But that totally makes sense because she definitely had enough hope to get them out of the situation. And the rain came and um, and then they 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 were actually able to have a little bit more hope again that they could actually complete this mission. And as soon as as soon as that happened, as soon like he wasn't sick anymore. He was cool. It was all good. You know what I mean? So right. and that's kind of. To some extent, that's kind of true in real life. I mean, I know a lot of people uh, anecdotally talk about how, uh, s like, when people get older, sometimes it's like um, if one out of a out of a couple they've been together for ages, and then when you know one of the spouses uh, passes away, sometimes. It doesn't take long before the other to pass away. I was, I used to, uh, up to recently, I was working with this, with this lady whose uh, parents, the dad passed away and then the mom passed away. It was like, I think it was like two months later, and it wasn't even like anything in particular. It was just she just passed away. The what, like old age kind of thing. You know what I mean? So right. it's, I don't know. Is it true? Is that actually how it works? I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't been around long enough to figure that one out, but it kind of makes sense. Gotcha. Well, for me, uh, yeah, I watched the scene and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of despair going on in this. The, they both realize like, look, we're, we've gone as far as we're going to go. Cause he says that to her. It's like, you know, you don't want me to lie to you. Right. Like this, this is it. This is the end or whatever. You know, we've, 
we're, we're not going to make it out of this. And she's like, no, I don't want you to lie. And then he kind of, he kind of passes out because he's obviously, you know, ill probably from the leeches and, you know, from just, he's been just pushing himself hard. I mean, you know, pulling a boat through those reeds, it's probably not an easy endeavor. So, I mean, he's just exhausted and stuff. And, uh, but the, the prayer though, like, I, I don't think it was a prayer to God to like get us out of this. It's, I mean, it was a, it was a come to Jesus moment in the sense of like, you know, look, this is it. We're, we're both going to be joining you soon. And I hope you can forgive us for what we've done. And that's where I kind of like pointed out, like, you know, there was a little bit more going on than they showed, you know, they, they, there was some hanky panky on that boat a little bit along the way. And she's, you know, a little remorseful, but she's like, look, when we get to the pearly gates, you know, please don't judge us for our deeds, but for our love, you know, allow us to enter the kingdom of heaven. So I think that's, that's really what the prayer is less so much about like, can you save us? And, you know, and as she's doing this, you know, it's kind of like, cause she understands like she's going to probably die of dehydration soon and everything too. And that's just to stand, there's no out of this. And I, I, and then you see the camera pan up and you see that that lake is like, you know, like I said, about a hundred feet away. I actually thought when I seen that, this is where the movie should end. Like maybe this is not meant to be an happy ending movie. Like I thought that was the perfect place. Like, look, it shows, you know, the human endeavor. They tried everything they could and they just fell short and had no idea how close they were to their goal. You know, and I thought what a powerful ending that would have been. I mean, I still enjoy the ending that we got, but I think that would have been almost a more powerful ending for this to, to you know, finish up on. And, and I, I don't know. I don't know if you're allowed to have such a dark ending back in the fifties, but uh, you know, sometimes movies don't always need to have you happily ever after. Sometimes it's just like, look, you, sometimes you don't win, you know, but you, you tried, you, you gave it your all and you, you tried to get to that finish line and it just wasn't going to happen. So, and I don't know why I feel like that, but I just felt like, wow, that would have been a really powerful ending. And I think it would have been so profound, especially with her kind of like, look, we're going to be joining you soon. You know, please, please forgive us for our transgressions and allow us to, you know, enter heaven together you know, more or less like as husband and wife, you know, even though we weren't really officially able to do that. So that, that was kind of my take on it. That would, that would be an interesting ending. That'd be almost be like having your father cut your hand off after your best friend got frozen in some kind of metal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that, that definitely would be pretty powerful. I've watched some pretty crazy tragedies in my time and yeah, man, th those are tragedies are real powerful when done correct. And that would be, but you know, this is more of a love story, I guess. So, yeah, but if it, if it, <laughs> if it was supposed to be a tragedy, that would be it right there, man. I agree. Yeah. I, I think you could have tied it up. Maybe as like, you know, look, they both passed away. The storm came along it lifted the boat up. It floated out the German boat didn't see it and it blew up the boat anyway. And so there was like, you know, people figured out who they were and what they were trying to do. You know, there could have been some, like a kind of a Titanic ending. It's kind of sad because one of them died, but the other one kind of got to tell the tale. Only the boat told the tale, you know, instead of the two people who were trying to achieve the goal. I don't know. I mean, that might seem a little hokey, but if you wanted a little bit more of a, an ending that kind of wrapped up happy in a certain way, they could have done that. And that had been an interesting ending as well. Interesting. Well, well, they'll have to do that for the remake whenever they do a remake of it, because you know Hollywood's always remaking stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, they tried it. It was it was uh, called you know uh, what Jungle was that Cruise. Disney movie? Yeah, the Jungle Cruise. Jungle and they didn't do it yeah. there either. So yeah, it, it they failed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So well, but the ending that we did get is uh, you know they they get out of the uh, out of the reeds. They're now floating free in the the lake, and they decide they're going to shoot across the lake as fast as they can. And of course, then they see the Louisa coming for them and uh that's when charlie realized that the louise is coming at them pretty quick what do you say like 17 knots or something to that effect yeah, um, yeah. traveling pretty quick so they they immediately turn around and head back into the the reeds to, to get some cover and um part of me is thinking when the louise is going by how can you not mistake that huge long mast at the top of the boat for other, anything else other than a metal pole you know i Obviously, it would have been, you know, another ending to the movie. They would have just shot it with their cannon and thus ending the movie. But no, they managed to to, to go right by the, the African queen and not even stop. And then uh, Charlie makes that comment of, oh, the Germans will be back. And he like calculates, you know, the, the distance of the lake and how far they would travel and roughly what time they would show up again. And that that then allows Charlie and uh, and Rose to start building the, the torpedoes. Um, and, you know, I'm all about MacGyvering, 
But uh, some of this seemed a little a little far fetched for me to to. And again, you probably have to suspend your belief. But I just kind of want to know what your guys' thoughts were on on uh, Charlie building these two torpedoes out of oxygen tanks, not really knowing. I mean, it, in my opinion, they didn't really seem like uh, torpedoes so much as like just giant bullets. Um, you know, he had the primer, he had the ignition, he had the the uh, the gel that was basically the the ignition for it to create the bomb. Um, what were your guys' thoughts, Tim? You know, you're a you're a you're a ballistics kind of guy. What were your thoughts on these torpedoes? Okay, well, I'll answer, I'll answer both questions. So your first question was how they didn't see him. Schnapps. There's your answer. <laughs> okay. okay. That's my answer for that one. It's the only one I got. Uh, secondly, I, I watched him put this thing together. So he's, they're, they're opening up these cylinders, which one, opening up a cylinder is pretty hard to do. Uh, so I guess he must have had some big pipe wrenches and stuff and managed to do that. And you got to escape all the gas. And yeah, it was really and it just the... Uh, the ability to empty that tank out and then open it up it has its own problems, I think. And then once you got to open, you got to pack it full of the explosive that they have easy enough to do. And then I'm watching, he's taking wood and he takes four bullets and puts them in. They look like 308 rounds. At first I'm thinking, where's this gun been the whole time that you have these 308 rounds just laying in your <laughs> boat, but there's no gun. I thought that was very odd. Like he could have been firing back at the Germans when they were going by or something. So I thought that was really weird. And he puts all four of them in there and then kind of aims them into inside the cylinder like okay so now you've got something that if you can shoot them off the you know they'll go off shoot themselves into the explosive which should should, between the gunpowder the flash and the the projectile hitting it hard enough although you said you can hit that stuff with a hammer it doesn't go off so i'm not sure what exactly makes that stuff go off because that's not really a primer i mean it not really in all intents and purposes but it was they were really vague. They kind of described it that nothing will make it explode yet. Yeah, primer will do it. And I yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird. But anyway, it, it was almost like they were explaining it was C4, but C4 is not around yet. Uh so but I'm thinking, okay, now you're jamming this into the head of that cylinder, but you have to have something that can pierce those four primers on those bullets in order to, you know, ignite each of those rounds into inside the cylinder into your white explosives. And I'm like, so now you got to have some kind of pin thing that, you know, definitely when it hits the boat will push hard enough on these primers and cause them to go off. And I'm like, I didn't see that part of it. So I don't know how he put that together. He, he mentioned, he mentioned nails. Nails were, were he actually said okay. there was nails that were going to hit the end of the bullet that would ignite the primer that would okay. cause the, cause it to go off. Yeah. I must've yeah, missed that part. It's like a hammer basically. Yeah. But it has to be so perfect. Then the boat would have to be going hard enough that I can hit those primers and pierce them. I mean, you know, it's yeah. gotta be the, the, it's gotta be the perfect hit. I mean, absolutely. Per- and those things are on the front of the boat and they're aiming out, you know, probably ones, ones that, you know, like 10 degrees, you know, and the mm-hmm. other ones at like 350 degrees, you know? So like the boat, even if it hit it head on, wouldn't hit those enough to pierce it. Like it, the boat would have to counter itself a little bit on one side or the other. And then the boat would have to hit. It's just perfect. So I, yeah, I, it's a one in a million shot. It's a one million shot, kid. Get it and let's go home. You know, I don't know. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I just the, the logistics it's of that was stuff. Yeah, it's, it's back to Hollywood being Hollywood stuff again. You know. But again, I mean, you gotta. But nobody else is gonna think about it like I'm going to. You know, I mean, most people are just gonna be like, oh yeah, that seems acceptable. You know, <laughs> so. Yeah, it's like it's like if you were to blow up a large space station in space, it wouldn't actually create a bunch of flames and light and <laughs> and stuff like that. But on screen, it looks cool, so you know people don't really question a whole lot. You know what I mean? Well, but, though, you would have a little bit of fire though, because you're letting all the oxygen out of the ship, so you're going to have that quick burn off of oxygen. So that, there's that. I'm, I'll give them I'll give them the quick flame out in the space. A tiny amount, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I said quick. I said quick. <laughs> um, in this in this scene, what I thought was really, really, really cool was was the ploy. There was a bit of a ploy that uh, Rose was doing. So when they're talking about the plan and they're putting the stuff together, um. Uh, Charlie's like, you know, this is going to be pretty much a one man job. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I, I understand. I get it. 
And he's like, well, you know, whoever's, you know, the one person who does this is going to have to do X, Y, and Z and blah, 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 blah. And this is how it's going to work. And I'm going to be the one to do it. And she's like, no, I'm going to be the one to do it. I, I'm the one man. You're not the one man. I've got to be able to do this. And the whole point to this, she was, she wasn't trying to be the modern, you know, strong female character. That wasn't the goal. The goal was so that they do it together. That was the goal. And yeah. I thought that it was really cool that they they didn't say it. They didn't say it. You just had to know as the audience. You just had to pick up on how the the female lead, the female character was actually going about trying to achieve her goal. And her goal at that point was to just be with her man. And if that meant you know that they're not going to make it out of it it doesn't matter to whatever end she is going to be with her man and i thought that was just so cool when i when i at first i didn't notice it until the end of that scene and i was like oh my god she totally did that on purpose so that they can do it together that was the whole point and he, and she knew that he would be like be like well i'm not going to let you do it so i guess we can do it together that's fine you know she she knew what was coming it was like she was playing three dimensional chess. You know what I'm saying? Well, he yeah. was playing checkers. <laughs> yeah. Well, she reiterates that too when they're on the boat and they're getting questioned by the Germans and they're like, "Well, we're going to hang you both." And she's like, well, "Please hang us together." You know, if we're if we're going to hang, we want to die at the same time. So she does that again, which is also my favorite scene when he's like, "Hey, uh, I have a request," and he's like, "What?" He goes, "Marius is like, what are you? What? You, come on, Marius, so just make her happy." He's like, "Fine." He's like, "Do you take her? Yes. Do you take him? Yes. Okay. Continue the hanging." There's like no pause. It's my favorite <laughs> line in the whole movie. He's like, "Do you take <laughs> to be your lawfully wedded wife?" I do. Okay. Continue the hanging. <laughs> <laughs> was that was the best awkward transition in the whole movie but yeah but she does there was do that. a, She's kiss. Like, there was a yeah. kiss yeah 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 it, it was neat that the okay i now pronounce you man and wife okay execute them yeah um <laughs> so yeah well that pretty much brings us to the that's the pretty much the end of the movie there um you know so they, they prep the boat uh they they sail out at at night and of course it starts raining and uh the boat overturns because it, it capsizes because there's too much water and they're now free floating away from the boat and they get picked up by the german soldiers separately um i honestly when i was watching it i thought that maybe rose um made the shore, shore safely like maybe she was a stronger swimmer i also thought that maybe she got you know picked up by a crocodile or something um so I was like, yeah, it, it sucks that, you know, he only gets, to, he, he lives and she dies, but yeah, no, we, we get to see her show up later, uh, with, the, during the trial and, uh, a rather neat trial process, which leads then to them being found guilty in the whole execution sequence, which we've just covered. Um, any thoughts on from when the boat flips to when they get picked up by the Germans, you guys got any thoughts on, on those scenes? I thought it made sense that the boat like sunk that the african queen sunk because they put holes in it man who's who's you're not supposed to put holes in a boat like what? Yeah. <laughs> you, that's not how it works and i, I and i'm living in the midwest i never really be i'm i'm never really on boats and i know that you know <laughs> we know better than that <laughs> <laughs> you know but uh i mean i you know it was it was cool i so I don't know exactly how they get on shore in the book, but apparently in the book, somehow they get on shore. I think they still get captured by the Germans or whatever. But what happens in the book, instead of the African Queen's torpedoes puncturing into and setting off the charge that capsizes the Louisa, the Royal Navy actually take out the louisa they show up as they're uh, um on shore and they watch the royal navy obliterate the louisa that's what happens in the book so cool why that changed in the movie i don't know um but that that is the difference that is one of the differences that had uh happened gotcha 
I think the the one the one scene that I really liked in the the whole trial sequence is that they just flat out tell them, you know, what they were planning. You know, we were, well, we're, we we planned on you know destroying this ship because we we were going to build torpedoes. How are you going to build the torpedoes? And they, they just break everything down. And I just think it's funny that you know they're, they're saying all this because like, well, we know we're going to die. And I doubt they're going to believe us. Maybe they'll let us go because, you know, we're just crazy, two crazy people. But, uh, yeah, I just I just thought it was funny that they just flat out told them what they what they planned on doing and how clever they were. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so that's that's pretty much the African Queen. Tim, you got any final thoughts on uh, on the movie? Um, no, I think I've pretty much covered everything I wanted to cover on it. OK. How about you, Rick? Any any scenes or anything you want to? Any last thoughts on on what you thought of uh, the African Queen? I am quite the sucker for 1920s and 1930s dialogue. Like uh, I tell you what, man, I I watched that uh, Boardwalk Empire, and I just love the little. The, the you know that little pieces of uh, the little one-liners that they used to use back then, like saying things like um, "deer" and "doll" and and um, man, what what's some of the other things that they would say back then? Cut uh, the flim flam. Yeah, just all those little you know uh, cliches, euphemisms, and all that stuff, man. I, I, I really like it, man. I really, I really like it hearing that different, it's almost like a different language, but using English, you know what I'm saying? And I, I don't know. I, I do like English. that. I yeah, think Rick yeah. just went full Randall on us. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like, you don't even like people, but I love gatherings. Rick's like, I don't like movies that predate me, but I love the dialogue. <laughs> I do. I, I really do. I like, I like hearing the, just those little little bits, you know. I do. Nice. Um, so, just a couple of last questions I've got before we we segue further along. Um, so, this is a I had mentioned earlier. You know, this is this is a river movie, a riverboat movie. Um, how, in your guys' opinion, how does this movie stand up to other ones? Uh, case in point, uh, you know, Apocalypse Now or. Um, uh, it's not really a riverboat movie, but it's kind of the same principle. Six days and seven nights. I know Tim. I know, um, but you know what? Where does this fall to you? For you guys, in in a in a romantic comedy riverboat kind of scenario like the Jungle Cruise, and I, I'll I'll pass it over to to Rick first. Uh, like how does it stack up against them? Yeah. Um. I mean it. If you're cool with watching a, a movie for the acting and not for special effects, if you're okay with watching something that doesn't have like massive amounts of special effects and that um, has it's a little bit different than what you're normally going to be watching, then I think this is def I think this is better um, because it shows. I mean, I keep going back to it, but it, it really does show what a, what a real strong female character in most uh, in most people's lives, I think. I don't know. Maybe nowadays you probably don't see it a whole lot in real life. You see a lot of boss babe attitude going on with the females nowadays, but but uh, females in their in their feminine nature um, and you don't see it a whole lot in pop culture and you almost don't at, at all see it in pop culture at all nowadays um so to be able to see that and i think when you marry someone you i think you kind of do see it a lot more than maybe what other people might not see um because uh i mean people do fall back into their you know their masculine and feminine kind of nature when you remove all of the other stuff you know what i'm saying when you really get down to it and you're you're living with someone for you know 5 10 15 years like it, it just all you know all that extra stuff kind of goes away so yeah if you really want to see something like more realistic more raw i would say definitely i think this is i think this is better man 
um, than a lot of st- a lot of riverboat stuff that I've seen. A lot of times I have problems with stuff nowadays because it's all it's all I mean it's fake, but fake in a way that it's it's against the human experience kind of fake, and that's the problem I think that people have with a lot of the Disney movies that you see nowadays because it's just fake from a human experience, man. I mean, tell me that it would make sense that you could get stabbed with a lightsaber and live. The next day, you're like, nothing happened. You know what I'm saying? That don't make any sense, man. That plot armor is so thick. (laughs) (laughs) Gotcha. How about you, Tim? How How does this movie stack up with other riverboat movies for you? I think riverboat movies are too niche. I don't, I don't feel like it has the same presence of like a Western or, uh, you know, like a, a tomb raiding, you know, adventure movie, like Indiana Jones, there was plenty of those that they made back in the, you know, fifties and sixties and stuff, you know, and even modern day ones with like Laura Croft and tomb Raider, stuff like that. Like you, you don't have that many. Cause I mean, when you talk about apocalypse now it's a riverboat movie, but it's a war movie. You know, when you talk about jungle cruise, you can't even count that one. Cause that's Disney's way of just trying to rip off this IP. Basically it was Walt Disney's favorite movie. He wish he had made it. So they have a, uh, a ride based on it. So they're like, well, we want to, you know, we want it to be ours. So let's write a jungle, you know, the jungle cruise movie. And then we can claim that that's what the ride is based off of now. You know, they, they did that with purpose, not with the idea of making a great film. And I just, you know, even six days, seven nights, it's, it's just a different kind of movie. So I, I don't think you can, there's a lot to compare with. So I don't think I can say one's better than another, or this holds up better than that one. It, it, it is what it is. And it kind of stands alone, you know, uh, for what it is. Well, my my whole question was to to lead to this joke. I think it's a far better three dimensional movie than that eight minute public domain two dimensional black and white steamboat Mickey Mouse steamboat Willie <laughs> riverboat movie. I would watch this time and again over that mouse with big ears. <laughs> Hey, dude, if I got to pick one, I'm going totally Popeye. I'll just watch that. <laughs> so, my all right. Well, 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 I hope my joke didn't take away too much from from this next question. But uh, would you guys say this movie is worth spending time off your death clock? And Tim, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, is it worth the one hour and 45 minutes to take off your death clock? I am now going to become Randall. Uh, this is not a bad movie. Uh, and this is a movie I could have lived my whole life without ever having watched. Uh, it's just, it, it didn't, I mean, it has some moments in it. It's not a bad film. It was very well done. But overall, I, I like if I had never watched this, my life would not be empty because of it. So uh, I, I think you could probably pass on unless you really like, you know, Humphrey Bogart or Kathleen Hepburn or you like riverboat movies or you feel there's a hole in your life where you haven't got to watch one then go watch this one for sure but uh yeah overall it's uh it's just kind of there it's kind of for me it's just meh you know man that's where i'm kind of at with it gotcha uh how about you rick um i'm actually going to agree halfway with tim um i think it was a good movie and if you are i would say over the age of 30 I would say you probably don't need to watch it. But if you are under 30, if there's anyone watching this, listening to this that is under 30, I think this is a must watch, actually. And I know that it, for some people, it might be a little bit difficult to watch because it doesn't have all the flashing lights and special effects and all that stuff that modern movies do. But because, like, I've talked about on this podcast before that I do stay up somewhat up to date with the uh, uh, manosphere and uh, a question comes up a lot of times on it as to what is real feminine nature and some people have a really tough time articulating what it means to be a strong female and what strong female characters are and This is such a good example. It really is. So for those of you who are listening and you're under 30, 
I think you have to watch it. I really do. I think it's it's just that important. But everyone else, uh, if you're you know over 30 or if you're on the cusp or something like that, <clears throat> then you have to kind of weigh out whether or not this type of movie is going to be important for you to watch. Um, the older you are, I think the less important it is for you to watch based on that. Gotcha. So does that mean that you're going to force your teenage son to watch it? Uh, I, I am going to recommend it to him, yeah. I, I didn't I this wasn't one that I asked him to watch actually and I really should have I, I didn't know I'd never seen it before but yeah gotcha. well I am I am going to take the stance of yes it is worth taking time off your death clock um, I think that the story is still riveting uh, it's a period piece so it's always neat to see something that was that takes place during a particular time period in, uh, in and it also is a movie about location and about relationships and and it's just a really cool story and i i think it's well worth taking time off your death clock to to watch it um so yeah so we got a no a maybe or a yes possible yes and a yes so two so one and a half we got a one and a half <laughs> one and a half okay <laughs> one and a half on the death clock all right. Well, as much as it's been fun drifting down this river with you guys, I am curious, what else are you watching other than uh, the Amazon, not the Amazon, the African queen? <laughs> How about you, Tim? What are you watching? Uh, so I've watched two movies outside of this one uh, this week. I uh, watched The Money Pit with my wife, uh, you know, the 80s film with uh, Tom Hanks and I uh, oh, can't think of her name now. What's Shelley going Long. on? Yeah, Shelley Long. Thank you. Uh, and it was it was a fun. Cyber. Was, yeah, yeah, there you go. Cyber me. I had a brain fart there. Uh, it was it was a fun movie. It was everything I remembered. You know, anybody who owns a home and has had to you know, fix it in any capacity will thoroughly enjoy that film. So it's it's fun to see Tom Hanks when he's very, very young. Uh, it's fun to see why Shelley Long did not have much of a movie career after Cheers. Uh, so, and uh, but it's just, it's a good time. It's it's a fun '80s movie, so I you know I recommend it. And then uh, the other movie I'm watching is I'm watching Fellowship of the Ring because I will be on the MCU's Bleeding Edge this Friday. We will be live streaming the film with our friends over there, and uh, I believe Rick too is probably watching this as he will be joining me uh, along with. Uh, uh, true knowledge, Jeff, and uh, we will be with, I think, uh, Cyber, or as we like to call him, the Cyberpedia, and Andre's a pop culture guy, so uh, it should be a lot of fun, and uh, by the time you hear this, uh, it will already be out, so if you uh, get done with this one and you are uh, got some extra time, uh, go check out the Fellowship of the Ring on the MCU's Bleeding Edge. Awesome. Fantastic. How about you, Rick? What are you watching? Well, I haven't uh, rewatched my fellowship yet, but I'm really looking forward to doing that. Uh, it's one of my all-time favorites. But uh, stuff that I've watched in the recent past, I got a list here. I've got I'm still going through Hell on Wheels slowly but surely. I'm I'm uh, hitting episodes uh, pretty much like one or two per week, um, and it is really good. It's a show about it's a 2011. Uh, television show about the reconstruction period uh, of the American uh, constructing the American railroad. And it's a show about vengeance and money and love and a bunch of stuff. It's really, really cool. So far, so good. Um, I, oh man, this one, oh boy. And I got my son to watch this one. I think that this is another one that so important for uh young in particular guys to watch um get out is a movie 2017 jordan peele uh, film and it is one of the in my opinion one of the most crazy psychological thrillers out there um man oh man this one's crazy and it is a for guys i think it's a must watch for young guys in particular it is a must watch and i think that there's an extra weight placed to um guys that have that are also uh persons of color i think um it's basically about a white girlfriend and the problems that happen 
when the white girlfriend brings the African American uh, uh, boyfriend to meet the parents. And have you guys seen this one? No, I haven't. But I have seen uh, "Look Who's Coming to Dinner" with Sydney Poitier. Oh no, that that's no, no. This is this is something. <laughs> this is something way out there, man. Way <laughs> out there. <laughs> This one is way out there. Tim, have you seen this one? I have not. Oh, my gosh, man. Uh, anyhow, super good. I highly, highly, highly recommend Get Out. Uh, although I, I told myself that I wouldn't watch this one again after I saw it because it was it was too much for me to handle. But I had to watch it with my son so that he can see this stuff because it's crazy. Anyhow, um. Also watching Delicious in Dungeon. I finished it, actually, the first season. Apparently, there's going to be another, a second season. I don't know when. The uh, It's a, a 2024 Netflix uh, anime show. It's like a hero anime. The manga goes back to 2014. And basically, it's about this uh, adventuring party that got eaten, where the, the cleric in the party got eaten by a dragon. The party get teleported to the surface. And they need to get back down to rescue and revive the eaten party member while the dragon is sleeping in the in the depths of the dungeon. The only problem is, is that they're absolutely broke. And in order to make it all the way down there and not starve to death, they have to eat monsters. So it's it's man, oh man, this one is this one is really good. I, I this one is good. It's a really good one especially for those who are casual about, you know, anime. And just yesterday we started to rewatch Peaky Blinders. And I don't know how much I got to say about this one. This one's just all-time great. Uh, all-time great. 2013 post World War 1 British gangster movie. It's awesome. My son and I were literally watching the Dungeon show just before the podcast tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like it so far? I, I've seen about four episodes now, and it's a show that as I watch it, I'm like, I'm not exactly sure that I like this show, but I'm not 100% sure I don't like this show, so I just kind of keep watching it. It's like, it's it's <laughs> it's such an odd premise that I just, it's like a train wreck. I just can't turn away. So I, yeah, I don't know. It's It's just, it's strange, man. It's a really weird premise for a show. It's. I will say that it, there the plot doesn't really come into effect until a few episodes in. So you said you've watched four. It probably will. You'll start to feel the pull toward yeah. the plot after maybe this. Probably the next episode. Actually, you start to feel it. And yeah, we just watched the uh, live live suit of armor episode. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then basically, the the pretty much the next one in the next two you will really start to feel it start to pull toward the um, toward the plot and it is a really nice plot actually so how many episodes is the show uh so far there's 24 out oh okay and it would suck if it was like eight next season it would suck if there's like eight episodes and it's not like the fourth episode that you start getting a plot I no hate they're stuff like that they're like 15, 20 minute episodes. So oh, okay. you can power through this thing in a, in a handful of hours, honestly. Gotcha. Cool. How about you, Matt? Well, speaking of Netflix, I, uh, I've been looking forward to what is not being called Beverly Hills cop four, but Axel F. I finally sat down and got to watch it the other day. Uh, you know, as of this recording, it was uh, it came out on July third. I actually got to watch it when it came out. It was it was cool. There's a lot of nostalgia to it. It's a really well written um, Beverly Hills Cop. It it parallels a lot of the original Beverly Hills Cop uh, movie, and uh, Eddie Murphy brings brings his the, the is like, brings back the top of his game. I mean, it, it's almost like being back in 1984 watching the movie um obviously you know he's not he's not a young eddie murphy anymore you know he's in his 60s uh, a lot of the characters have aged along with him and it's it's interesting to see some of those 
those same characters from 84, you know, reprising their roles in this movie. It's, it's really fun. I recommend it to anyone who's a big Eddie Murphy fan or a big fan of Beverly Hills cop. I mean, you could probably watch the first one and then skip two and three and go right to, to Axel F. Cause I mean, it's, it's, it's really good. Well, Matt, they don't even just have to watch it. They can go listen to our previous podcast about Beverly Hills Cop <laughs> and then go watch that and then Axel F. So there you go. Go check it out, guys. There we go. I set them up. You knock them out of the park. Thank you, Tim. I, I do what I can, <laughs> sir. I do what I can. Well, um, I want to take this opportunity to let our listeners know that uh, this is probably our last episode without Joey. Uh, if everything goes according to plan, Joey will be joining us next episode. And I want to take this time to especially thank Rick for filling in his shoes. Uh, Rick, I hope that you continue to, 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 to stick around with us because it has been a real hip, hip, hooray hoot to have you join <laughs> us on these episodes. Um, yeah, yeah I've, and, had well, I've had very well done, sir. In fact, I will give you the golf clap. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for filling in. We have really enjoyed our time with you. You've done an excellent job and we couldn't be happier. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, it's been fun. It's been real fun. I, I, I appreciate it. I, you know, and I appreciate you guys allowing me to come on too. You know, it goes both ways. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, folks, uh, if you've missed him, he'll be back next, next week for uh, our coverage of a, 1980s classic so stick around for that next week and you'll get to hear joey again and uh with that i think i'll turn it over to you tim all right well thanks everybody for listening to the middle age movie reviews podcast uh we hope you've enjoyed the podcast and uh one and a half of us hope you go and enjoy the movie and uh if you have enjoyed the podcast uh please like and subscribe to us we need to get our numbers up uh we we can't do that without the help of our listeners so if you listen to us on youtube definitely subscribe like us there same thing with uh you know apple podcast spotify whatever you know leave us a little love let us know that you're enjoying what we're doing so we can keep on doing it and also if you want to continue the movie conversation check out our new group on facebook uh middle age movie reviews group and uh don't forget that we're also a part of the electronic media collective podcast network all right everyone thanks for joining stay cool and bye everyone and hey thanks for listening uh no giveaways tonight but uh listen to a future podcast for another opportunity to get something cool